Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome all to the Forest Displacement and Urban Management Conference of 2021. This conference is organized by the IDI, URF, and Indonesian Civil Society Association for Refugee Rights, Protection, SWACA. Supported by Advocates for Refugees Singapore, ourselves, Ecumen Spaces for Dignity, known as Ecumen Studio and Mixed Migration Center. Over 79.5 million individuals have been forcibly displaced by persecution, conflict, violence, environmental crisis, or human rights violations. This is a high record which equals one person becoming displaced every four seconds. 85 percent of refugees are hosted by developing countries, including Indonesia. That is why LDI URF feels the need and urge to understand in any way possible how to contribute to the assimilation between urban refugees and host communities. We strive to increase awareness, knowledge, base, and public discourse on how cities in Indonesia will come and deal with refugees in respect to the regulation and framework in the country. Our thematic session to space and place in everyday life include topics on architecture, environment, urban design, and its intersection with forced displacement, geography and speciality for the forcibly displaced, placemaking, social initiatives, integration and empowerment, identity and place belonging and technology, big data and social media as the new space and place. We are glad to offer today a rich program, including 11 interventions divided in four panels, a quite highly challenging program. So we would ask for all participants to mute their microphones first, to use the chat for questions and interactions. We rely also on your patience in case of technical issues or internet instability. Our team is working hard to keep a high quality streaming. We will be also thankful if you leave your feedback at the end of the session through the link available on the chat box. Without further ado, I formally open the thematic session too, and I wish all the distinguished speakers and participants to have a fruitful and insightful discussion during our session, space and place in the everyday life of the refugees and host communities. In the first panel, we will have three key interventions. Q&A will be open at the end of the three presentations. I will not be presenting any audio biography, but only presenting our speakers with their titles. And I'm sure you have already read their biographies available on the conference website. That is why you are here today. So on behalf of all the organizers of this conference, I'm pleased to welcome for the first panel, Ari um, Chakso, Chaksono. Uh, he's a media and communication specialist at the Center for Migration and Border Studies in the representation of refugees identity in Indonesia constructed by national narrative online media. So the floor is yours for 10 minutes. Thanks. Okay, uh, well, Insa, thank you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. Uh, well, Oh, okay. Uh, well, uh, hi, Ari. Uh, we can see your your screen actually. It's a black, it's the, now we, yes, yes, now it's started. Perfect, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> okay, uh, well, Insa, thank you for giving me the opportunity to present my research at this session. Um, today, I will present my poster entitled The Representation of Refugee Identity Constructed by the National Narrative Online News Media, Study Case of uh, Calidarous Refugee News Coverage in 2018 until 2019. Um, okay, uh, the humanitarian crisis that happened um, on the side. Sorry mm -hmm. for interruption, it's still black actually. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, it's fine, take your time. No problem, okay. Um, we still, you know, 
people are joining. So it will be perfect for them. Okay, is it? Uh, okay. Okay, is it okay if I uh, visualize my paper like this? Yes, now, now I can see it very well. Perfect. Okay, okay. 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 Uh, the humanitarian crisis that happened on the sidewalk of Peta Selatan Street at Kalidodos District of West Jakarta in early 2018 until 2019 has led to public debates. Hundreds of refugees and asylum seekers were found stranded on the sidewalk and living under the tent due to the overcapacity of shelter and even the immigration detention center in Kalideras district, West Jakarta. This humanitarian crisis raised the social problems that stimulated negative sentiments towards the existence of Kalideras refugees and asylum seekers. It is the media that has a critical role to disseminate the refugees' social reality in a real time and to construct their representation of identity through news discourse. This research questions how the Indonesian online media constructs the Kalidaras refugee and asylum seekers identities and their representation as described through narrative discourse published on the national news website. To answer the research question, this study employs the descriptive, descriptive qualitative approach it emphasizes the process of interpreting the phenomena of the refugee crisis with a comprehensive analysis without generalizing the results of the analysis of the data obtained. This research employs a post positivist paradigm that is closely related to the qualitative methodology and provides independent space for researchers where data interpretation does not involve the role of the news script maker. Okay, and in gathering the data, uh, this research employs the documentation techniques by searching specific keywords on the Google web search engine, for example, Kalidaras refugees, Kalidaras asylum seekers, and Kalidaras immigrants with a publication period from January 2018 until February 2019. There are 39 online news articles published by 17 national online news websites, which describe and visualize the refugee shelters in front of the Jakarta Immigration Detention Center at Kalideras District, West Jakarta. Uh, the theoretical approach of this study used the social representation theory by Brigitte Hoyer. This theory explores how the media and socially represent societal and political issues in modern society. The fundamental idea of this theory is inspired by Moscovici's theory of social representation. It refers to the cognition stamping of the collective thinking of society that is externalized through two fundamental communication mechanisms with a set of subcategories. There are anchoring and objectification. Then in analyzing the data obtained, uh, this research used social semiotic analysis by Van Leeuwen. The social semiotics approach of representation and communication sees all modes as a meaning-making system, all of which are integrally connected with the social and cultural system. Media contains semiotic structure that is interconnected and it is the product of object manipulation as a function communication of each sign represented through words and visual pictures. Okay, um, Fan Luan, Fan Luan emphasizes four dimensions in the social semiotic analysis that aim to unlock the representation and ideology explained through the structure of the text. These are discourse, genre, style, and modality. This research emphasizes discourse dimension Discourse dimension with a set of subcategories that are action, manner, actors, presentation, resource, time, spaces, exclusion, rearrangement, and addition. Okay, and then um, the data analysis shows that 
Pedia used an anchoring mechanism with subcategories naming and stereotyping. As the data shows here, uh, that the media use naming mechanism in describing the existence of refugees and asylum seekers in Calidores. There is an expansion of terminology and a shift of meaning-making system related to the terminology of refugees and asylum seekers. Some national online news media, for example, iNews, and then liputanam.com and tribunews.com even use illegal immigrant to describe refugees and asylum seekers identities in Calideras. And then um, the next, uh, the data analysis also shows that the stereotyping mechanism is used by media to create the illusion of defining social groups and evaluating other people. The media define the representation of refugees and asylum seekers identities into seven categories of stereotyping. There are um, the representation of despair and hope. Some media define refugees as a triggers of cross-cultural conflict among refugees or even local. They represent refugees as a representation of victims of human crisis and conflict as well. They are represented as the domination of the political policy and powers and the representation of environmental and sanitation problem as well. Uh, they also represent refugees as a threat to national security and the representation of urban space problems. Okay, um, to refer this uh, research findings, this research delivers three recommendations. Uh, first, the building capacity for reporters or the media actors in creating narrative migration is matters. And the second, the future challenge, media should promote the existence of refugees as a representation of victims of human crisis and foster cross-cultural communication gap among refugees and local. And the last recommendation is a media as the agent of change for refugees' social protection. Okay, uh, in short, that's all. Thank you very much. Very good. Thank you, Ari, for your presentation. Um, it was appealing, and I, I think that you know the attendees should keep their questions um, after you know we finish also with our next two speakers. Um, uh, now we have Ulima Nabila Adinta. I hope that I'm pronouncing well your your name. Sorry if I don't. So um, Ulima, uh, she's studying for bachelor degree at the Faculty of Cultural Science, University Gajamada in rebuilding spiritual lives in the new land, religious practices among Afghanistan refugees in Indonesia. The floor is yours, Ulima. Okay. Thank you so much for, uh, for the time, okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Good people who close their eyes and attention you today. My name is Olima Nabila Dinta. On this special occasion, I would like to present my chosen topic of research that is rebuilding spiritual lives in the new land, the religious practices among Afghanistan refugees in Indonesia. Regarding today's role, there will be an introduction, which will be a momentum for background study explanation, a research question, and how the background has now done to it through preliminary studies conducted and later the methodologies I will be using alongside with how I plan the research from now onwards. And well, if we go back to 40 years ago, Indonesia has been a transit country for asylum seekers and refugees since the exodus of Indochina. Since years ago, the migration flows have been established between Asia and the Middle East. Okay, uh, I assume that most of us are aware upon the chaotic schemes happening in Afghanistan recently. Elaborating into the point of refugees as people who are aiming to seek asylum, we can learn it toward the data collected by UNHCR. Maybe for the next slide. Uh, the data on July 2021 shows that the refugees from Afghanistan have a percentage of 56, almost 56 percent, with a total number of 7,472 refugees. They are ethnic Hazara. Okay, here Hazara is being mentioned, but what Hazara is and why did I mention it? It to, uh, to it will come to your attention. Hazara are 
uh, Persian speaking Siang Muslim who are both ethnic and religious minorities in Afghanistan know that the Hazaras issues has been clearly discussed. So let's put a clear spotlight on how this specific ethnic group survives by adjusting and evolving in most Indonesian in West Java. Okay, maybe for the next slide. Thank you. Hazara refugees are mostly put on their beliefs into Shia Muslim, which is slightly contradict with the Muslim population in Indonesia, which leaning their beliefs towards Sunni. Thus, a label of Muslim is apparently not enough to make the easy adjustment happening as the domain are remains different. This makes the first problem. Well, based on the explanatory reviews upon the issue, I come up with how do Hazara refugees form a negotiation for their groups with the local community of West Java, Indonesia, while their religious beliefs are different? As my mind, this is a question. Okay, let's come to the next slide. Okay, so to answer the question, I'm planning on conducting a participatory observation using ethnographic data in order to look deeper at the process of the adjustment. The reason why I choose to conduct my study with these two are first, and the ethnographic data is believed to help identify data and analyze unexpected issues well. And the second, participatory observation would help to identify the detailed information by observing participants' behaviors, attitude, and emotion through the, inter through the, through the interviews I will be conducting. And let's come to uh, my preliminary study about this topic. Uh, so, recent studies show that the religious lens plays an important role for the Hazara refugees in the negotiation process amid a multicultural Indonesian society. In particular, they have little meaningful contact with the host population and do not adopt the language, behaviors, or cultural practices of their neighbors. They respond for their protective situation by forming a strong ethnic community that is distinctly spirit from the of their Indonesian counterparts. That's right. Let's come to the next slide. So uh, the study actually is still ongoing. So uh, I'm planning for this research. So the next the next step of the research, I would like to do are first finding a collaboration within the institution related to the topic. And the second, uh, using literature review to gather more data and recent studies about the topic. And the third, scheduling time for doing a field work in Cisarua. Okay, this is the reference and here I am closing my abstract on the topic of which I have chosen. Thank you so much for the time and for listening. Thank you, Olima. And it's very interesting, um, you know, research as uh, the same for Ari. Um, we will go, I'm looking, you know, for the whole attendees that, uh, you know, they start also uh, writing their questions. Uh, but anyway, we will have plenty of it uh, later on. So. For, to close this first panel, uh, we have with us uh, Leila Zibar. She's an architect, urban researcher, and doctoral candidate, a dual doctoral degree between Brandenburg University of Technology and the University of Leuven in the anchoring roots, in roots, the case of Syrian Kurds refugee camps in the Kurdistan region of Iraq. The floor is yours, Leila, and thank you yeah. for being with us. Hello and welcome everybody and good morning from Belgium. Um, so today I'll be um, yeah, a little bit talking about refugees and the idea of re-anchoring roots on roots. Um, this study and this research is based on my PhD research that I've been doing so far in the Kurdistan region of Iraq. But additionally, it is also related to a chapter that I have that is coming soon and it's related to homing refugeehood. Um, this is also based on ethnography and um, ethnographical methods, where I did my field study in Kurdistan region of Iraq between 2018 and 2020. So we will start. So the idea of refugeehood basically is a spatial um, by essence, and it's fundamentally related to geography, to the partial or the complete rupture and disposition from one place to another. So the question is what rupture means and how rupture is actually relates to people. It's a big question of how people actually relate to place, relate to geography, and how the embedded relationships of citizenship, of generationally transmitted roots, historicities, networks, and of memory. 
So whether this displacement is related and however it is treated, there's a few factors that we have to consider, which is basically how forced displacement and territorial disposition actually affect the modes of governance, affects population, and how it is related to borders, to migration routes, to natural environments, but it also relates deeply and connects deeply with locality, with citizenship, with community, with metrics, with memory, and with the idea of home. When we talk about rupture, we talk about rupture from all of these factors and change into different regimes and different ideas of a humanitarian regime of refugees becoming victims and homeless depending on the regime that actually perceives them, but also how it creates different and new territories, how it creates different boundaries of community boundaries and host and refugee boundaries, but also it relates to opportunities, different ways of perceiving lives again and again, but also it creates this mode of alienation of an IDP and a refugee, of a social fragmentation, and then these diasporic networks and how nostalgia actually drives a human being to think of how himself being homed or homeless in an alien geography that he just arrived to. So if you wanna talk a little bit about first displacement, it's always about a receiving structure. And when we talk about space and place, we talk about receiving spaces that actually contains these new people who are fragmentations of ruptures that happened in the past or in the recent past, but it also it's a time space rupture of how time is actually experienced within the camp, but in the outside world and how years go by. However, what the refugee experiences is a state of waiting in a frozen time and a moment in a space that it's alien to him. And then it creates a mode of placing this space somehow and an emergence of it. To talk a little bit and to come closer to my case study, we talk about the Syrian conflict and the Syrian conflict to many people also, it embraced in 2011. And also later, furthermore in history, it was exacerbated by the attack of ISIS and how ISIS actually controlled parts of Syria and Iraq. The group that I'm also addressing is the Kurdish uh, ethnic, uh, the Syrian Kurds basically people who hold the Syrian citizenship fleeing from the country of citizenship to Iraq, to the Kurdish region of Iraq. While I'm talking about this Kurdish ethnicity, we need to understand that this historicity of this region and this axis of fleeing also has historicity in related to the modern state's creation and how this creation divided what many of the Kurds perceived as a fatherland into four states. So the question here becomes for the Syrian Kurds, especially arriving to a camp, is it a move from one homeland to another? Is it a homecoming or is it actually seeking refuge? The question embraces itself and appears and is embedded in geography and in this axis. So to think about it, we need just to check here in the map and you see this connected two regions and basically this big, what what many Kurds perceive as Kurdistan, this big green line, is also a continuity of history, of generation, of culture and community. And then to talk in Edward Said's terms, how these communities of language, of history, of memory actually have the same background. So the question is, what is home? And how do we reroute or do we anchor in a place somehow is ours, but we are refugees in this place, became a real question for the, the Kurds. But in all cases, this landing is different. The landing after all is not to a home, but to a camp, to a state of refugeehood, to a tent, to a material provision of a humanitarian regime that perceives the fleeing as a victim and as a homeless. Thinking about it and coming closer, I'm going to talk today to about two small micro scale cases, but I just wanna give a little bit ex explanation about the context itself. So what I'm talking about today is the Maze refugee camp, which is in the Hulk governance. And in this camp, when people arrived, there was different kinds of modes of flows, flows of population, flows of aid, flows also of goods, but in addition, there is this structural or assessment of stuff. So we have built environment, we have natural assets, but also we have different modes of building and rebuilding and setting this receiving structure to absorb this influx of refugees. 
The camp opened in 2012 with a capacity supposedly for 30,000 people. It peaked to 80,000 in 2014, but then it declined back and stabilized this year to 31,000. And we're talking only about registered refugees because also the camp hosts people who come to the camp, but they are not registered. So it is estimated that this population actually is double of the hosted ones who are not registered with UNHCR. Looking at the camp and looking at its structures, we can see clearly how this urban grid actually creating a system of distributing infrastructure, but also distributing what the system calls, what the regime, uh, the humanitarian regime calls a community, basically a 16 units plot. The camp is bounded, it has a gate, and this was the initial start. A rows of tent that actually being improvised and changed by the needs of refugees according to the harsh environment and extended needs that are happening and prolonging in time. Three different typologies have been developing. So the start is with a basic tent, but then with the, with the prolongation of the, the camp, the different intensification of influx and population arriving to the camp, there has been also two different models, which is the improved shelter and then the upgraded shelter. The improved shelter has a concrete base with three rows of, of blocks and also facilities of a kitchen, a bathroom and a toilet built with brick. Everything is temporary roofed, but then the upgraded shelter is basically two rooms with the same facility, but it, again, it's a temporary roof of sandwich panel. Different modes of development and self-built projects has been taking place in the camp as well. But when we think about it, we see how this mode of having these different uh, material provision, but also projects and cash for work for refugees provided different ways to actually reconnect with this alien geography by building with yourself, by helping people, by hiring communities. Different modes of building happening were taking place in the camp. But to come to the micro scale a little bit and to see how people actually are experiencing the camp is a different story. Om Ali and Abu Ali arrived to the camp in 2012 with a family of seven. They have built this home of theirs, or what they call as a shelter, in a different way. Om Ali, when she describes her story about how she arrived to the camp and how she arrived to a basic tent with only few corrugated sheets, she's describing how fearful it was for her to actually listen to the rain drops on the, uh, on, the, on the sheets and imagining how bullets were fleeing into the room. But also she was talking about how the health situation of her husband did not allow her to wait for the NGOs to give her the materials. So she had to improvise, the family had to work and everybody had to somehow contribute in building their own shelter. She, she, while she was crying and telling me her story, she's talking about how hard it was for her and her family to actually go along with this situation and how her health, the, uh, the health of her husband and two children could not bear the tent and the torn off walls and the temporary roofs and the dripping water. So they had to move along and they had to not wait for other people to provide. What she has from the NGOs are, as she says, only the mattresses and a door. But she also is preparing for a new life to take course. She is waiting, that's true, and she's trying to anchor in a place that is not hers. However, she misses home, but she talks about moving forward while the girls needs to get married, so she needs a proper guest room to receive these people. But again, she talks about uh, her boys working and coming back to a home that needs a space and a safe place, and also providing the financial means for her husband to be taken care of medically. Yet, though the story of Amali sounds like a story of anchorage, waiting for another solution, the story of Bawar, who arrived to the camp in 2014, is a little bit different. When Bawar arrived to Kurdistan region of Iraq, he didn't arrive directly to the camp, he went to the city. But when he decided to get married, he went back and moved into the camp. In 2014, a lot of people started to flee the camp and to go to Europe. So it opened a lot of spaces to people who actually have built units to actually sell their entitlements to a different family. Bauer took the chance and found it as a good deal to get a built, already built shelter. But then again, it, it was also, it had a shop and this shop he could rent to other people. Bauer's feeling that his life started in the camp 
and how he is relating his new story and anchoring and rerouting in a place that he proudly claims that is his and he believed in his sense of nationalism, but would actually join the Peshmerga, which is the Kurdish army in fighting ISIS. And now he is hired by them as one of the military powers. He is proud to belong and he doesn't wanna leave. He wants to stay in a land that he claims that is his. So the question of, and also the question of family, he has around 50 family members with their families between this camp and the other camps disputing in the, uh, the close areas. Whether they are rerouting on routes or whether they are re-anchoring, the question is, what does home mean now? Is it a home or is it not? Did we leave home to reach to another? That's another question. But the material structure, building and investing and becoming part and describing your own stories through material structures and through, through bricks and walls, attaching your own memories and also reintroducing to people how you think is one of the main factors that actually stabilized the life in the camp and reintroduced norms and codes that have been disappearing along the uh, migration wave. The idea of having the same community of the same language, the same dialect and the same memory is also playing a large role in stabilizing the situation. But also we need to acknowledge the fact that the open working policy that people allowed to work and have work permits is helping how to, they the, root in the camp. Their ability to support their family members, their ability to have these care clusters that are actually mobilizing the life in the camp and stabilizing it and actually creating uh, an idea of an immediate future that could be reached soon. Though that homing is taking a long, uh, a long cycle, however, at least in my study, I would say in camps, there is this idea of a perfect home. It's either idolized in the past or either looked forward in the future. It is ruptured from a time space continuity by this crisis. And then people start to normalize. They start to fall this to a humanitarian rhythm, but then they hybridize this rhythm with a rhythm they know before. They go from an anchored beings in a tent, fragmented fragments to, be, to bridge with the alien structures. <clears throat> through improvising, but also through building. People start to live in the camp. They live within the spaces. They actually have families. They go generationally and generationally. And in the global South, we know that the age of the camps are ranging between 10 to 50 years today. And we're not talking yet about the Palestinian refugee camp with a different story. When we think about the camp, when we think about home and anchoring and rerouting, we need to think where are we and when are we and to where we are going in terms of space and time? So this is what I wanted to say today. And thank you for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Leila, for this uh, journey about um, the life of displaced people in refugee camps and uh, putting you know, a critical overview about what the meaning of hoping and putting it as question actually uh, can we really consider that as, you know, uh, a resettlement, uh, a home, uh, how to move forward? Um, and, uh, you know, this photo shows a lot about the reality and uh, also the, um, let's say, to put on the table the discussion of if we should continue with this, you know, um, approach of creating refugee camps um, and, um quite uh, i'm questioning their existence actually if they should really continue or not and uh, how we can really call them in the future because it looks like basically we are uh, you know facing a, a new settlements uh, where uh, a lot of challenges are facing the people who are living in but also those who manage it at a certain point and I remember our discussion as well that a lot, and maybe our audience doesn't know that, that the majority of these camps today, um, international organization like the UNHCR, they won't be able to sustain it for longer uh, term. So with this uh, presentation, um, I close basically the first panel uh, and I open uh, the, the questions for the audience. Um, so go ahead. So let's see if there is any questions for all our speakers. 
Yes, so we have the first one. This is Raisi. Uh, she's asking, hi, I would like to ask to Ari. So this is for you, uh, our first speaker. The stereotyping mechanism presented is really interesting. Uh, what do you think about the overall narrative represented by national media? Does it lead to misinformation, rejection toward the existence of refugees, or demonstrating a call for the broader public to help and support the refugees? Okay, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Risha, for the question. So, uh, after, uh, after February 2019, uh, all the refugees uh, in the front of the immigration detention center is moving out from that, that, that road. But then um, the narrative discourse uh, from the national media then uh, led to the dynamic public debate. So uh, it can be separated into two pers public perspectives. Uh, some of them uh, make this negative sentiment towards the um, refugees population and the calidores. And then uh, another uh, social group uh, see the, the refugees as the, uh, as the social group that need help. So, uh, from that perspective, uh, many NGOs and the locals uh, bring uh, basic aid from them. So actually, uh, until they are moved uh, outside Calideras, there are uh, dynamic perspective uh, from the from the uh, news uh, media uh, at that time. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you very much, Ari, for the answer. I have a question here for, um, you know, uh, Nabila Ulima, and then after Leila. So based on your observation and exploration, and especially we saw that it's about participatory, or, you know, observation phase. So I would love from my side to know more about your, your tools and how you conducted these ob observation, I mean, uh, phase. Are there any activities or interactions showing the locals acceptance towards Hazara refugees or else? How are these dynamics of social interaction between Hazara refugees and the local community? So, okay, thank you for the question. I actually, I didn't have, uh, I didn't make any observation directly uh, in Tisarwa Bogor because you know this is still my research planning for 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 the topic and uh, the, the recent studies that I've been re that I read. Uh, for for this for this proposal is that uh, they 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 show it shows that uh, they build a strong ethnic community. That's why I want to look deeper by doing observation participation. That's why like I didn't have uh, I didn't make I didn't I still didn't come to the place. So that's why I'm sorry for the question because I cannot reply it right now. Maybe it will uh, when they come when I do a field work in Cisarua. It, I, I will, I will, I can explain it more. I, I can explain it clearly. That's why. Thank you, Insa, for Thanks. and also Thank yeah, you. yeah. That's why, like you. I, I really need a, a support and also a collaboration with some people who are also interested in this topic. So that's why I really want to know how they survive, how they do it, uh, how how they survive and how they negotiate themselves in Cisarua, living in Indonesia. Because I think in Indonesia, like nobody. Uh, it's only few people who are interested in this topic and maybe like so many some of my friends like they don't know if there is also refugee in Indonesia that's why thank you so much so basically it's great because here mm -hmm. you also link it to Ari discussion about raising awareness and the key role of you know uh, media and reporters in bringing mm -hmm. these you know, yeah. stories yes. to yes. the general public. And mm -hmm. uh, I think as well that maybe we understood it very well, you know, you put it that sense that your hypothesis is about the, the how also religion, which is also mm -hmm. part of the culture and um, quite of, you know, challenging yeah. sometimes um, in, in a context where these people, you know, it increase uh, let's say the clustering or the mm -hmm. way how they just close to themselves and this is links also to what Leila said about yeah. that sometimes these features can help you mm -hmm. know sometimes to stabilize but they are not also durable through time because at the, at the end and in, in particular that now Indonesia the majority of you know refugees it will be 
a good situation as they were in transit. Today they are settling. So yeah. it brings these aspects and these challenges um, on the table. So the question for Leila, for refugees asylum seekers stuck in the space-time rupture you mentioned, where they might be waiting endlessly for response from authority. How can they you know, best be supported? Have you seen individuals who can still thrive in this situation? Volunteer with some such individual in the UK and the sense of limbo can get quite dear. Um, thank you, Amanda, for such an interesting question. Um, to be honest, yes and no. Um, so yes, I have seen some people thrive, but the question is to how long. Um, there's a problem um, be between the division of, I mean, what is called the global south and the global north. And it is also related to who is actually controlling the decision of where these refugees and asylum seekers go. So yes, they can be supported to a certain extent in the what we call the global north, where many states actually control the um, yeah the, the destination of where refugees actually arrive and supposedly to continue their lives. In the waiting time, I would say the most cases that I have been noticing that these people who have a little bit of social accomplishments or at least engagement with the daily day to day activities um, and some initiatives also, for example, here in, in Belgium, we're trying to teach some refugees how to bike and um, some of them actually give them a few bikes to just stroll around the city and be engaged and see their surroundings. I'm not saying it is creating a different sense or a little bit, little bit uh, yeah, a connection. However, it's a question of anchorage and asylum seekers in the waiting procedures cannot anchor because they know that this phase is ending. However, the idea of engaging basically with the material structure around them is helping a lot. A level of personalization, building a few relationships sometimes helps a lot. The idea of being able to celebrate something small that they can see and hold in their hands. Sometimes um, a lot of women who arrived um, in, in, in a limbo and who arrived and they couldn't, for example, speak or talk, but they started to, to bike. The idea of, for example, having this bike and going through the city, being able to claim a little bit of power over their control and the destination and how they reach this destination play the role. I'm not saying it is better, but I'm saying it is a different state. The camps in, 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 in Kurdistan are basically people who are staying for now, they have children who were born in the camp. In the asylum process, people freeze, literally. So the idea of having this material things that you can carry with you is limited in comparison with the camp. But I would definitely say having a little bit of a social relationship, being engaged in building uh, or in doing something that materializes um, in front of you that you can see that you did in the waiting time could actually help you absorb the waiting time itself because you see the building and then you see how long it took. So there's a little bit of a relation of what time means. And this is what I would say would be essential, but I wouldn't claim that this works for everybody, to be honest. It is very, um, yeah, very individual, the idea of, of being a refuge. It's a, a personal experience that you cannot just simply bypass, but it is less harmful when it becomes a more a collective, uh, familiarizing the self at least or relating to the other I would uh, suggest this but I don't have a real solution for that I don't think anybody has so far but that's why we have such you know conference and debates to be able all collectively to find out at least some paths for for the future so thank you very much for our first you know uh, panelist and uh, it was really a great uh, you know interventions um, please do stay with us for the second panel. We won't have a break for the moment as we wanted to keep you know, the attention for all the attendees as well. We have 69 for the moment, which all of us, which is really great uh, you know, audience. Um, so now uh, we will start with directly with our second uh, panel, which uh, will start with also Riza Rize. I hope also, I'm sorry if I really not not really pronounced it quite well. Um, he's an architecture student 
Um, so he will present for us his research about refugees, housing solution within the host community in the East Saint uh, Kain, and you can you can really correct it afterwards. My bad. <laughs> so. Okay, thank you. Hi, welcome. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I am Reza Rizai from Afghanistan and uh, one of the refugees live in Indonesia. I am a student architecture in Indonesia. Uh, today, I will present my research about uh, refugee housing solution with the host community in the East Chengkarim. In the first, we have to see uh, what is Chengkarim. Uh, that the place uh, we are I uh, choose is Chingaring in uh, Java Island in Jakarta, as we see. Uh, there, this research place in F Chingaring, which is area of Suchi Foundation flat housing complex, which now is one of the UNICEF Indonesia active partners. But uh, there are six another apartment complex for middle and low families, interaction happiness and in public areas such as citizen hall, soccer flat, swimming pool, children playground and market. As Zalfa said in the previous research that during and certainly about their relevant legal instrument, social interaction between the refugee and their host communities cannot be avoided. This led me to a question with need answer. What is the housing solution for refugee? within the host community and their S. Jinkarin. I use uh, three theories, Maslow basic need, because human need shelter and need some place they call, they can call home. A house should fulfill the Firto Paris theory and on good architecture design, which must uh, meet the WHO standard in housing and health get. For this research, I use uh, interview and desk research. The basic problem is uh, that with itself, it make bigger problem such as in Santi, the patient and personality disorder. After I interview five responded, they felt like they are vertical living as cheap, but correct problem to for their lives. They cannot call it home. It feels like just a, a residence the room is hot, noisy, and it uh, doesn't have a space for seating rooms. Usually, each room has uh, small living rooms that is used for everything. Uh, cook, preparation, watch TV, and so on. If the room is a studio, they, everything with the sleep in the air, the corridor is a miss walking as quick hot and they need some uh, urban farming so that they can make uh, themselves busy and predict better food this is the whole poster for the research i make it and this is the design as we can see in uh, the back of the building is Suchi Foundation. And, and uh, around of my building here, uh, all 
uh, six uh, buildings as I see in the first. The whole concept is like uh, a lock that facilitates or needed for the mental health of the refugee. Market and soccer felt will make a good social interaction with the host communities. On the Vietnam lift, uh, we can see the dry market. It's used the morning and the stairs can also be used as a place to watch the soccer match in the afternoon. On the bottom right show in the third floor, which as outdoor space with as use for children play area and sport area on the outskirts. There is, there is a 1.5 meter height wall for safety and security of residents. The circulation is used uh, very much in both of the site. The, this will bring the wind in and push the hot temperature out on the central holes. Other reason for using very much is to make a place to think with clear mind. The hall and every floor is used a general area for the refugee to gather for the simple things to such as swing and groves, small thing, small talks or children play area. And the central of the building, there is guide light and we can see the whole inter, inter building, every side of the rooms get good lighting. All of the walls material is using uh, concrete with the and solution so the sound from the outside of the building is not going to strip the uh, residents. As we see here the total is 370 units, each two bedrooms unit size 6.2 meters times 8.5 meters, each bedroom size 2.5 meters times 4 meter. And uh, that's all from me. Uh, thank you for your attention. If you have a question, feel free to ask me. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Riza, for this presentation and your work on uh, developing a housing solution for refugees. And uh, of course, we will have questions uh, later on, so we keep them after our two next you know, presentations. Um, now we will have you know, uh, three actually members who will be presenting um, facial quality of safe houses for domestic violence survivors by Jasmine Amanda Kuriniadi. She's a fourth year undergraduate student in architecture program, program University of Pelita Harapan. We have also Julia Dewey, she's the senior lecturer at the Department of the Architecture in the same university. And uh, with, um, you know, uh, Susan T. Paracoso. So thank you very much for being here with us today and looking forward to see your presentation. Um, thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, is it? Uh, okay, yes. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today, we want to present about special qualities of safe houses for domestic violence survivors. And this is the poster which we submitted. And let's start from the beginning. The Indonesian National Commission on Violence Against Women or Komnas Perempuan stated that there was an increase in domestic violence against women during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, they reported cases of violence that had been uh, in its two thirds, which is the cases of domestic violence. The, uh, the data from LBH APIC also shows that there were 110 cases of domestic violence that have been reported during the first three months of large scale social restriction. Um, according to <clears throat> 
to a statement from Documenta. The increase of domestic violence cases during implementation of quarantine occurred due to the impact of increased stress levels and uncertainty of income. Then the local government has provided safe houses for women and children who are survivors of domestic violence, which is a temporary residence used to provide protection from survivors according in accordance with determined standards. The intensity of meetings between the survivor and worker in safe houses also varies according to the stage of recovery from the survivors. Safe houses are generally managed as a non-profit public sector. It is considered as a low-cost housing. Therefore, the floor area per occupant tends to be limited. In fact, sufficient space is needed to accommodate interactions between survivors and workers. Um, and then the current designs are usually based on practicality and is on maintenance rather than hearing to costs. Uh, here are some objectives based on the formulation of the existing problems. The study aims to identify the physical and psychological needs of survivors and the kind of spatial quality that can support the recovery of residents, and then analyze what kind of architecture provides sense of security to survivors and its influence on survival behavior development. Lastly, we create design strategies that provide a sense of security to survivors, which impacts survivors' behavioral development while in a safe house. And then this is the research framework. Uh, first of all, literature review method is used in order to find the needs of domestic violence survivors and to identify which design criteria can support those needs. Then the criteria are applied into design strategies, which are developed further using inputs received from a designer who has experience on a safe house, on designing a safe house. And then uh, next we're going to uh, go to the literature review. The, fir uh, the first phase experienced by the survivors is the reception phase, where the survivor has just arrived. And then the first few weeks, they have been many emotional and physical needs. Therefore, in this phase, the survivors have a high intensity of meeting with workers. And then the second phase is where the survivors begin to feel secure and try to rebuild their and test their own boundaries. Apart from that, this phase is also seen as an opportunity to explore new freedoms. Third, in awareness phase, survivors are more competent to pay attention to themselves and their situation, the resources available to them, and what they want to do next. In this phase, the survivors generally begin to express their feelings in ways such as talking to other residents, worker, counselor, as well as volunteers. The final phase is the phase which is the survivor and the workers accompanying them begin to prepare for them to leave the safe house. And then there are several provisions exist to optimize the use of safe houses as facilities for the physical and psychological recovery of survivors. Some of them are high quality and well-maintained accommodation, adequate security measures, bedrooms with privacy, private lab facilities, shared kitchens, communal areas, quiet room for interviews, and many more. And then it can be concluded that the needs of survivors can be grouped into five groups, namely uh, certain ambient ca characteristics, spatial arrangement that enhance the intensity of meeting, promoting certain safety criteria, maintaining certain level of privacy, and creating certain levels of flexibility. The group of needs will be linked in the design criteria that can support recovery. Uh, uh, Jetlin, sorry if I might ask, can you zoom in more because people can't really see very well, but I think it's quite blurry. Um, oh, you know, we okay. need very strong eyes. Um, uh, to 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 look at it, maybe you know to zoom at least on the graphics, um, and that oh. we can follow probably uh, where you are. Thank you very much. And take your time. You are really have you know uh, we we really have time. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, let's uh, please wait. Thank uh, you. Pause to share first. So as you can see, you know, the 91% uh, there on the top, you can really put it like 120 if you can type on it or 150. So in your browser, you are in page five. So you can, you can see here the zoom percentage just in the middle. Thanks. If it's not possible, I mean, we, we will, we, the posters are also available, you know, on the website, so we can really focus on you also describing. So don't worry if it's 
if it didn't work. Um, it's okay. Okay, I will continue to share. To yes, share. please. Go ahead. Go ahead. Is it clear now? Oh yeah, now it's perfect. That's okay, perfect. Great. <laughs> great. Um, so this is the table for. Wait, wait. Uh, this is the table for design characteristics by survival recovery stages, and then there's the description of it, characteristic, and then at the end of it, I we conclude it into the needs of the survivors, and then these later needs will be connected into uh, into the um, design criteria that can support it. So the several design criteria influence the physical and psychological recovery of humans. The application of design strategies can potentially create ideal spaces that are not only physically protect survivors of domestic violence, but also develop survivor readiness to return to society. Each strategy presents design criteria that should address the needs of survivors. The five design criteria are surrounding environments, physical permeability, security and privacy regarding visual permeability, spatial dimension and shape as the most rigid or space forming elements to change among other elements, which has a significant effect on defense capabilities. And then lastly, is this connection with nature related to physical and psychological recovery. If concluded, the design criteria that can support physical and psychological recovery include the include the surrounding environment, physical permeability, visual permeability, connection with nature, and the shape of and size of spaces. For physical recovery, the supporting criteria are physical permeability and spatial dimension and shape. Meanwhile, the psychological recovery, the supporting criteria are all the criteria listed above. So as you can see, the from this diagram. Uh, there's a connection between the needs and the design criteria. It will be explained later. More. And then for the in interview. Uh, an interview was conducted with a designer who participated in a safe house project. In this interview, the author got information. Uh, we got information about what kind of design strategies they use in the safe house they built to ensure safety and the recovery of survivors. It's, it's located in Sumba. Sumba Safe House is a safe house designed for victims of sexual violence for teenagers and children. This project was built due to the high sexual crime rate and the culture that considers the victim of a family is a disgrace, so that many victims are affected by their families. And the design strategies applied here is the division of space, which is broadly divided into three parts, namely the general zone, the buffer zone, and then the private zone. For preventive measures against external threats, this safe house doesn't doesn't have any very close or protective element because the location itself, it is located. It is located in the local area of this complex, which is uh, the place for complaints of violence. And then for the uh, for the precedent study, precedent studies were conducted to determine the design strategies used by existing safe houses. Houses that can support the physical and psychological recovery of survivors. Two presidents have were chosen to study what aspect they have and whether the aspects have been concluded in the literature review. Our complaint is in these precedents. A matrix composed of survivor needs and architectural elements supporting recovery will be used to analyze both precedents. And the first one is review para mujeres víctimas de la violencia in Mexico. In Mexico. Uh, this one story building intends to determine the significance and function of its protection against survivors by making the architectural elements fluid. And then the second one is the Ada and Fama de Shalit House located in Tel Aviv, Israel. The main concept of the safe house is a tough, safe and protective exterior and a soft interior facade centered on the courtyard and focused on healing. And then this is the circulation map and the plan analysis using the map X. And then the criteria obtained from this study President study are number one, the wall around the site prevents illegal entry of people. And then small unobtrusive gates 
to not attract attention and still maintain a high level of privacy. Number two is space with high privacy requirements has small dimension and are placed on the edge of the site. Gathering places has a larger area and simple access and is located in the middle so that the interaction that occurs will be more will be more the center of area of the site. And then the more layers of the room, the higher the level of privacy achieved and vice versa. And then the position of the start window can still be provide sunlight, maintain a level of privacy, then that's what makes the survival feel intimidated. And then the result and conclusion. Here are some design strategies that are uh, based on the needs of the survivors. And the first one is privacy, spatial form, and placement of function and circulation areas are, are the strategies. And then the use of transparent materials on one side as, as the use of one-way film. And then for the spatial arrangement, a low intensity entrance is camouflaged within the surroundings. And for the high intensity encounters, access is made, is made as much as possible and centered on one or four several points. And then for security, placing, place, placing space vertically according to the levels of security required. Then there are also differences in material and openings as well as circulation. And then for the ambience characteristic, reception room that contrasts with the outside area, either with the height of the room or various shapes. And then for the flexibility, a room with a Flexibility is depending on the intention of the room itself. The room that has high level of flexibility tends to have high spatial permeability. And then from uh, from those strategies, I we create um, two conceptual design alternatives. The first one is the zoning divided into three areas, which in, with the living area from the reception area. The common room is a semi-open space that wants to incorporate natural elements into the space. The floors are terraced and consist of two or three floors that, that have respective functions on the perimeter. And then the second one is the middle area, which is uh, the middle area of the common room is a garden and around it is a large staircase that continues to rise following the contours of the land until it finally arrives in the living area. And then from those two alternatives, uh, we create a schematic design for the gate we are using the camouflage strategy by matching the pattern of the wall with the entrance. And then for the circulation area between the function areas, it is placed in a private area. While for the functions located in the middle of the circulation, it is applied in the common room or semi-private area. Semi-open and then semi-open applied in the kitchen and also the dining room. And then the mass area hidden on the ground is on the ground floor on the private area. And then the, there are two entrances from the private area, namely the uh, below from under here and then from above. And then entrance is located to behind the circulation to be hidden from uh, guests. And then two way film layers are placed in almost all corners, especially in private areas to maintain privacy from survivors or of survivors. And then the plan is evaluated using the map X which is an uh, application so, uh, software. In this program, if the color is getting bluer, the permeability is lower and vice versa. Floor plan analysis proves that strategies applied to the design has succeeded in creating layers of surveillance and privacy that are subtle and not intimidating. Result shows that the physical and visual permeability of the design is achieved. The design strategy still needs to be tested further in a real life setting in order to prove its validity. And for the conclusion, spaces with architectural expressions that can provide a sense of security and freedom for survivors can be realized by an analyzing the needs of survivors, matching them with responsive design criteria, designing several strategies based on these and integrating them in the final design. The limitation of this research is that the search for data cannot be run optimally due to the large scale social restrictions that are taking place which is making it difficult to obtain the data directly from the safe houses. Furthermore, this research will be used as a basic guide, design guide for safe houses. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, your presentation. And um, 
and your research, just to put it in context, that it's quite interesting to see how we will be able and to think about designing safe places, which is considered one also of the uh, concerns of a lot of organization and civil society and also international corporations in being able, you know, to optimize and at the same time think about how they will be, you know, capable of creating such spaces. For the moment, it's only, you know, rehabilitation of existing rooms um, related to, you know, the limited resources, in instance. And um, it's great to see also that research are more now focused on the psychology of the forms and the psychology of spaces and how also, you know, uh, design could play a key role in um, beforehand incorporating such, uh, you know, um, psychological uh, needs uh, within, you know, the design criteria. So thank you for this presentation. And uh, of course, I might repeat for our audience and the new one that they can write their, uh, you know, um, questions in the chat. Uh, now I have the pleasure to have and with us uh, Joe Marlowe. Um, he's an associate professor in the Department of Counseling, Human Services and Social Work at the University of Auckland, uh, New Zealand. Uh, he will present today uh, under the title of Dislocation in an Age of Connection, Social Media and Transnational Networks. The floor is yours, Joe. Um, so hello and greetings from New Zealand. I'm just going to share my screen here um, and um, just to make sure that you're looking at the right. Uh, so can you just, just to confirm, can you just see one slide and not two slides? We do see the both, so we can- You see, see both, okay, let me, so let, 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 me just, let me just, let me swap the, um, does that change that? Yeah, Or is perfect. it still the same? Is that no, fine? No, it's perfect, yes. Okay, so um, uh, thank you for the opportunity to present. Um, and um, uh, I'm going to speak about research that I've conducted with people resettled, uh, people from refugee backgrounds that are resettled in New Zealand and how they use social media uh, to engage with transnational networks. And to sort of orient this is that, um, and the ways that we think about durable solutions is that uh, we, Often think about refugee resettlement is something that's about protection. And that once they come to New Zealand, that refugee settlement is about belonging. But what we're starting to also see is that the ways in which the, that third durable solution, which is resettlement, relates to other solutions and also to diasporic lives and, and people that are living in their countries of origin, is that incre increasingly that refugee settlement is becoming a transnational experience. And so if you look at that, that term of transnationalism, people like Nicholas von Heer have, have written about uh, that, that transnationalism is, is an enduring solution. That's something that sits alongside uh, durable solutions that, that provides sort of a chance that if only 1% of the world's refugees can be resettled, that this is an enduring solution that connects them potentially to that 99. So that idea of trans almost sort of suggests going beyond the border, beyond the nation, that in some ways that it's able to be uh, um, uh, surpassed in, in some ways, um, though not always evenly or in predictable ways. And but part of the problem with this is that and is, is that the state oftentimes only thinks about um, its policies with refugees within its own borders, failing to account that for many people that, that their experiences are an ongoing transnational experience. And that research as well has failed to in many ways accommodate this, that it oftentimes focuses on uh, how refugees might be living here without sort of recognizing that they might live simultaneously here and there. Um, and so this was a report from the uh, UNHCR that um, uh, was entitled Connecting Refugees. The green, blue, and red dots show the, at that point in time the main sites of dislocation. And um, what, the, what and where the blue and the uh, green dots are shows that where there's 2G and 3G mobile connectivity, suggesting now that refugees have ways of communicating with one another um, that wasn't once previously possible that we can also see again that this isn't uneven, and that this is informed by the affordability, the usability and the availability of these technologies. And many of you would have already seen those images of, of, of people making their way into Europe or elsewhere and you know, plugged into uh, you know, to a PowerPoint trying to charge their phones. But in many ways, what they're doing is they're trying to stay connected 
through to their networks to find out information about how they might cross borders safely, where they might go for assistance, um, to even create a sense of belonging. And that these, these, different, these different technologies and social media platforms provide various intimacies that are video-based, audio, synchronous, asynchronous, um, so on and so forth. And has at times been referred to even as digital lifelines, which is somewhat problematic in its presentation, but for many people, it has been uh, a critical tool to uh, make, help them make safe passage and also to uh, settle wherever it is that they might end up. And so what I did is I conducted a study where I worked uh, a digital ethnography, where I worked with people from refugee backgrounds um, in New Zealand uh, over a course of more than a year in terms of how they're using social media to practice transnational family and friendship. I got them to do weekly social media diaries. They I conducted interviews. And then following that, I conducted a national survey that was uh, translated into six different languages that tried to ascertain how refugees were using social media. And that's kind of what I want to present in my remaining few minutes. Um, and so just to kind of give an example of this, of just sort of one hour in everyday life, this was a woman who um, uh, was, um, uh, uh, you know, used, used, she, she used to wait for one fax message a year that she would hope to hear from her family to see here that they were okay. Uh, fast forward 10 years later, and she now, sorry, 20 years later, and now she um, receives 200 WhatsApp messages every morning that she wakes up that her phone is, you know, has had all these notifications. And so, you know, in just this one hour in everyday life, she writes about first how she connects to Kenya from New Zealand to, to try to engage with her godson. He's not there, but they're able to share videos with the auntie to then going to Belgium and the UK through LinkedIn um, to talk about uh, a cousin's graduation that they hadn't even met. Um, and then to connect into the Netherlands to try to get support about work-related stresses here in New Zealand. Again, making that case that we need to be thinking about settlement as a transnational experience. It also related to remembering and connection to culture and history. So uh, this quote here relates to remembering practices and uh, celebrating a grandfather who had passed. But there are other examples where um, a woman would uh, catch up with her mother in Indonesia and they would cook together as a way of transmitting cultural and cultural practices. But then that food that she cooked in New Zealand was shared with her flatmates or her roommates in New Zealand as a way of connecting to people within New Zealand. So again, this tool as a way of connecting to people across distance, but also those living uh, near them. Um, uh, one of the fascinating things about this research that I did was that uh, it, it showed the different ways that people continue to live ongoing political lives. And the, there's a reference that on, down there below that I published in relation to this around how social media relates to the subversion and the subjugation of, of, of political life. And so during this time, I mean, there are examples of where uh, one woman was supporting the Kurdish Peshmerga who were getting ready to storm Mosul to take it from IS. And they were actually uh, using WhatsApp to connect with her to get support before they went in and back to the front line to uh, a person who uh, ran a WhatsApp group of, of more than 500 members trying to reduce ethnic tensions in South Sudan. Um, to addressing chemical weapons uh, atrocities that are being committed in Syria, to trying to help identify missing persons, to rallying support for people living in Europe who weren't get, receiving settlement support. Um, and I mean, just as an example of the way that social media can spread so quickly, maybe you have seen this image of Ala Salab in April 2019. Uh, this one picture up that you can see in the top right hand pic screen there was was of her protesting uh, the uh, rule of Omar Bashir, um, a dictator in Sudan. And within, within hours, all these memes of her started to appear on various social media platforms as a way of people communicating resistance in different, in different ways. But fundamentally, what was most clear across all this research was its importance for identity and, and, and well-being. That it's almost this idea that it's a basic need, need for everyday life, that we grow and we're in connection. The person said half of me is social media. And that if they don't even have their phone, that something's missing from their lives. And so much so to the point that you can see this in sort of that popular internet meme that's off of Maslow's triangle, which, you know, is you know, at the very bottom, it's supposed to be sort of this like physiological needs and they put sort of Wi-Fi at the very bottom of it, almost sort of as a tongue-in-cheek tongue type of 
statement, but actually it speaks to something very real that, that this connection is something that's so powerful and so important that um, it might even go, um, it might even, they might even seek that before food and water in these cases. And just as kind of an interest, uh, the meme has been developed, which even has put battery life even further below it. But ultimately what uh, this speaks to is, is kind of this idea of transnational settlement support that it makes people feel connected and warm, give people even more practice in doing things in New Zealand. So it helps them to even cope in the current circumstances that they're in. Um, and that this can even help them to respond to extraordinary events. So I did things where while I was conducting the study, there was earthquakes in New Zealand and many of them actually heard about these events from their transnational networks that informed them about what was happening. And, and, and where might be safe places to go. And con conversely, at the same time, I thought there was, a, there was a mass shooting in Las Vegas that happened and the Afghan community in New Zealand was the first to warn the Afghan community in the United States that that mass shooting was happening in Las Vegas and told them to stay indoors. So almost this idea that they were sort of these international eyes that were, that were keeping watch um, over them. Um, and to even examples where, uh, they were advising people about whether they should step onto a boat into the Mediterranean. Um, and just to sort of shift this to the social media survey, which I'll be getting ready to publish some of the findings of this more um, uh, fairly soon, but just to kind of give just sort of a sense of this, just to kind of, uh, th this is just frequency counts. So the more sophisticated analysis we'll be uh, presenting shortly, but um, you can just see how often it is that, that participants of the 700 people that responded, how often they're using social media within New Zealand, uh, its importance in strengthening ties with family overseas, um, and also strengthening ties with family in New Zealand. And I've actually published some of this work in um, migration studies, um, if you wanted to have a look at it there. And then again, just fundamentally sort of using social media is important for my well-being. And whilst it's not universal, you can see this this, this statement that it, that it is something helpful for people to settle in place. Um, so much to the points of sort of thinking this idea of co-presence, so sort of blurring the, the boundaries of what constitutes real interaction and the ways in which people might be able to connect to family members overseas in incredibly powerful and intimate ways. Um, but also that they don't turn their phone off, that this might affect their sleep and maybe even their connections to local places. Um, but also this idea of it's kind of like they are here, bringing us back to the 1% and the 99. Um, but look, to kind of, kind of move towards concluding here, I'm not arguing for some sort of digital utopia, that, that there are many uh, cautions here amongst the many possibilities, that we can think about sort of the reliability of, of information that's received. Is it actually accurate? Is it timely? Is it, um, we look at digital inequality that as increasingly uh, we move into online spaces and interacting on Zoom and these sorts of things, um, it means that, that some people are able to engage and some people are not, and that this might even represent an additional form of exclusion. But the, that we also know that it isn't only people from refugee backgrounds that are engaged in these spaces. The ways in which politicians make negative comments and negative representations about refugees and the ways that these get spread virally so fast can actually powerfully inform how host societies um, respond to refugees, that it also kind of creates this homogenization echo chambers that if you were to look on my Facebook feed or my Twitter feed, the people that I follow, the people that I engage with, my friends, they're my friends because they're like me. And what this means is that oftentimes that we're not having the conversations with the groups of people that we need to be having the conversations and the conclusions that they have about forced migration are very different from the conversations that I'm having in my networks about the same thing. That we look at surveillance and people are now writing about sort of extraterritorial authoritarian aggressions and the way in which the state is now even controlling people beyond those borders of transnational uh, influence of this digital omnipresence that the, as these phones become things that sort of are constantly with us and buzzing and, and um, uh, you know, I had participants that actually slept with their phones at night and let, let them buzz because they felt like it was almost like a heartbeat that they could feel that, that they felt connected. Um, but this might also at times almost feel like an, an obligation, a duty to engage. Um, and then finally, just the dark side of social media. And we've just seen a, uh, a terror attack in, in New Zealand just a few days ago the, of, of a man who was influenced by, uh, by, by social media. 
So ultimately, um, understanding how social media impacts and at times shapes the associated social, civic, digital, and transnational spaces matters. And that we need to make sure that we're thinking about this in terms of how it informs policy, practice, and also the ways in which we conduct research. Because ultimately, this helps us to shift from trying to think about forced migration and where people might end up from them being able to just simply being present to how they participate, and the distinction between an invite and a welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much for, um, for this presentation. It was really insightful. Um, and it also uh, brings uh, a lot of questions uh, related at the same time, whether you know it's a fact, actually, social media is here, connections are, are here. Um, you know, it also question territories and boundaries and relationship and put everything to be, you know, rethought again. Um, in specific, you know, now when with our topic of displacement and refugeehood, um, these things also uh, start to become, as you mentioned, it, essential for their survival, essential for their uh, well-being of these displaced communities. A lot of work has been done, uh, even from USCR to to bring, uh, you know, to different camps or even um, other countries. Uh, support to develop networks because they found out that at the end this is what brings and makes people you know especially accessing uh, livelihood and at the same time coping with their new situation and third to be able uh, you know um, let's say also for data collection this is something that today uh, and you put it everything I think you draw the whole picture of it with its pros and cons. Um, so I, I'm looking for questions now because uh, this is, will be maybe we can open other other and dive deeper, I mean, in different uh, subjects that we have been presenting during the second uh, panel. Um, so here we have, first of all, just gathering some of them. Um, so we have the first question was directed to uh, Reza from John. He said, how did you come up with this design of vertical housing for refugees? Are there any refugee groups involved during the design process for this proposal? Uh, so this is the first question. Um, the second question also for you uh, from Yanni, it's about how did you come up with this design? It's, you know, um, the same, I think, question, but it's more specific to uh, spaces uh, which spaces can be used for social interaction with the surrounding communities. And um, they want also to know uh, and to hear your ideas and how the spaces can be activated. So these are the two main questions for you. Okay, thank you. Uh, the first I will answer the Jan's yes, question. Why I choose uh, vertical living? Uh, because uh, the refugee that is my respondent also ever live uh, in land house and they prefer in the vertical living because of the safety and privacy. As we know, uh, refugee in Indonesia uh, have a problem uh, with document and then when we uh, or want to rent somewhere house, it's uh, uh, a little bit hard than uh, we are want to rent an uh, apartment. That's why I use uh, this uh, vertical uh, building. And then for the safety and privacy. For the uh, Yeni uh, question, uh, the place for social interaction with the host community. Uh, and the first is in, uh, in the market and soccer field. For the market, uh, it's open for the both Indonesia and the refugee seller. The refugee seller can depos deposit uh, the goods on to the Indonesia sellers. Um, and the Indonesia sellers can sell in the market. For the soccer uh, field, of course, it's area well uh, naturally uh, call many people to play there and then uh, the soccer field can be uh, seen from the outside of the site. Great, thank you very much. Um, 
So for the question for Jislin, uh, we have as seen in your schematic design, the layout or the form is mostly curvy or circular. How does the circular form layout affect the spatial experience of the survivors? I would like to hear your opinion regarding the form selection as well. Um, okay, first of all, thank you for the question. And I don't know, uh, first of all, this is my architecture thesis project for my undergraduate study. And the circular form of our layout is implemented to eliminate the impression of the common social institution layout or the common safe houses, which is more safe and more like box boxy. And then the convex shape tends to give more chance to meet and interact with each other. Uh, therefore, the refugees or the survivors can support each other more easily. And then, uh, lastly, this the site of the project is located in the contract area. And as a response to contract area, this answers the three design problems mentioned before. Thank you very much. Um, so we have two other questions, and they are, you know, directed to Jay. Um, so uh, it's said uh, very interesting presentation. I understand that your research is qualitative. My question might be lining to quantitative study, but I would like to kindly ask your insights. Um, how did you select the respondents? What were indicators used for data cleaning? In my attempted research using big data, I'm facing the problem of selecting the data such as deciding which one is the worthy and the noise. Uh, the second question, is there any interesting pattern based on age and gender of the respondents that might influence your findings? Thanks. Great, okay, well, um, thanks Nina. So um, in terms of, uh, yes, yeah, so initially the, the digital ethnography was a qualitative study and then I developed a survey that so it, was a, it became a, a sequential mixed method study where I, I designed a survey in response to that. So uh, your question is about sort of big data and, and so the survey wasn't big data. So I, I, I won't have the same challenges that you're going to have around just immense data sets. Um, but in terms of how I selected respondents, I actually hired close to 15 people from refugee backgrounds to help disseminate the surveys that uh, as far as I'm aware, it's the first national survey that's been conducted in New Zealand with refugees. And part of that reason is because it's so hard to get people to respond to the surveys, they don't trust them. And so by having 15 people apply, 15 people from refugee backgrounds and created that, that trust. So it's not, it's not a representative sample um, in that sense, but it does, it does provide a helpful snapshot of what, of what some practices look like in New Zealand. In terms of big data, I think some of the things that's actually really interesting if we think about that transnational link is, is, is not just thinking about what's within one person's practices, but their actual networks. And so you can look at things like the Twitter sphere and see how people are connected to see how these different echo chambers work and those sorts of things. Um, I think can, can be uh, very useful to understand where people are getting information and, and, and who do they trust. Um, and then I guess going to, uh, uh, Yanni's uh, comment around any patterns based on age and gender. Um, the, the the qualitative study did find I did find that that men are far more likely to be involved in politics, political life uh, than women. Um, but the survey didn't actually bear that out, which was surprising that, uh, that there wasn't a significant difference across the 700 participants. But what we did find was that young people were more likely to be uh, politically active. But interestingly, uh, is also that people have been settled in New Zealand longer than five years, were more likely to be politically active. And the reason that we're, we're hypothesizing that that's the case is that it might be that they then feel safe, they feel safe enough, or maybe their, their transnational networks are also safe enough for them to engage in those activities around, around a political life. And just I will add, thank you, Jay, for this. Um, just for me, I would love to know from your side, uh, what do you think about, you know, um, what kind of key role um, social media and, uh, you know, access to these digital technologies um, will play in finding solutions for the displacement and, of course, migration and forced migration, um, you know, um, situation and and uh, challenges, uh, in particular for Asian countries where they are also this uh, digital technologies are part of their daily lives, as you also uh, might know. 
Um, and I think that the audience would love to see how this could be incorporated as well um, uh, from policymakers, from uh, you know humanitarian um, practitioners as well, and other people who are related to such uh, you know topics. Um, so I think that there's there's certainly a lot of possibilities there. I mean, there are examples of of countries. That, that are receiving forced migrants that have even created their own sort of apps and that sort of thing. But I'm not so sure that those have been all that successful. I think in many ways, it's about trying to engage in, in the app, social media applications that people are already using. So like, um, you, know, uh, you know, one thing we see like in New Zealand, for instance, is, that, is this focus on creating CVs and, and oftentimes people are still struggling to find jobs, but there has been some evidence showing that connecting people on WhatsApp to employers where they can sort of show the work that they've done and that sort of thing, that that suddenly, it creates a relationship where they're able to suddenly find their way into work um, to things like LinkedIn that sort of connect people through those, you know, two and three and four degrees of, of separation that that sort of build that 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 bridging social capital that's, that, that's oftentimes seen as so important when moving to a new country and, and incorporating with a new language to, to apps that help you to, um, uh, learn languages even to even uh, translate for you um so um you know but but and 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 also these these some of these, some of these applications can be encrypted um though to what degree is is not entirely clear um and so this might mean that that people are able to to engage more safely in certain things but it might also mean that with those encrypted conversations it might be even, it might be difficult to even sort of keep track of, of conversations that are had. So um, it's, I think it's one of those rapidly moving spaces. And I mean, I think one thing that, that governments could even try to do that, that could be uh, most helpful would even be subsidizing access that you can actually get very cheap phones now that if you were to create mobile um, uh, like Wi-Fi centers where people could connect that, that you know, um, one of the questions that I asked participants over the course of this year, the study was, if I could give you a five day holiday anywhere in New Zealand, and the only criteria was you couldn't take your phone with you, most of them said they wouldn't take it because staying connected is that important to them. And so if, if, if we think about settlement as an ongoing transnational experience and government was to support that, they might actually mean that that also has local benefits um, to people settling in place. Very well said. Thank you very much for saying so. And uh, it's time for a break. <laughs> I think everybody will need so. And please do stay with us because we still have two other panels, very interesting ones. Um, and uh, I hope that we will be able at the end to have a final debate. So um, I give you five minutes. Uh, thank you for all the speakers and for the interventions and being here with us today for this uh, second day of this conference. Um, so it's 8.40, uh, I mean, in Dublin time, not for your time. So I'll give you five minutes and we will be back for the third panel. See you then.
Well, hello, everyone. So welcome uh, again to this uh, thematic session to space and place in the everyday refugee lives and host communities. I'm pleased to welcome for the third panel uh, Sakib Fadan Ahmada. He's an editorial secretary at Journal of Social Development Studies. In his uh, presentation about risk and sub-politics, urban movement against water scarcity in Yogyakarta, Indonesia. The floor is yours, Sakib. Okay, thank you. Could you hear my voice? You can see my screen right now. Yes, it's perfect. We can see it very well. 
Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for the time. Uh, today, I want to present about my article. Actually, this is based on my undergraduate thesis in 2020. And uh, this issue is not specifically about uh, refugees or forced displacement, but uh, I think uh, this is an uh, interesting issue about uh, social initiative placemaking in Yogyakarta in Indonesia. Okay, uh, I'll start for the background that uh, uh, tourism sector uh, in this in today uh, life is one of many ways for a region to develop its economy. And uh, however, uh, tourism uh, in the process is also brings a consequence and. In this uh, research, uh, this consequence is uh, externalities to local communities. Uh, Yogyakarta uh, is a city uh, known as a tourism destination. In Indonesia uh, is also have many uh, destination tourists. And you can see Yogyakarta is a good city to uh, holiday and and whatever it is. And this the logical consequence of this condition is that tourism destination must provide the uh, accommodation for tourists to stay, which is hotels and apartments. And because of this condition, uh, in order to respond to the uh, massive hotel construction, a group uh, of city dwellers who named themselves as Warga Budaya, or in English means empowered citizen, then a campaign uh, Jogja Asap. And Jogja Asap means dry, uh, Jogja will dry, and, and this movement is focused on uh, hotel rejection. And uh, for this reason, uh, Power Gabdaya or WB was used as the unit of this research. And uh, the main question of this research was how is the process of Power Gabdaya as a political phenomenon rejecting the construction of hotels and in Nikyakarta? through Jogja Asad campaign. And like I mentioned before, uh, I use the term of the politics. And we, before we go to the politics, uh, I discuss the, about this term of race society. Uh, uh, race society uh, um, is the concept uh, by Ulrich Beck in 1993, this book about race society towards new modernity. And in simple way, uh, society means that uh, in this condition, uh, many threats of uh, environment or whatever is uh, produced by human activities. And risk is not about uh, natural, but uh, risk is about uh, the consequence about uh, human activities because of the industrial process. And in this uh, era of risk society, uh, there are uh, uh, group of individual and uh, community that uh, reflects this condition and and then uh, move as a social movement and uh, use the term of subpolitics. This subpolitics is distinguished from general politics, which like in Indonesia, uh, like legislative, judicative, or uh, executive. Uh, so politics means uh, which against outside a formal politics that can appear on a social stage. And uh, these agents can be seen as a professional groups, intellectual, research institution, and citizen initiative. And uh, this is referred to as everyday politics, uh, which can be seen through uh, people's daily activities and choices in informal politics of uh, daily environment. Okay. Uh, to answer this question, uh, this article uh, or this research employs a uh, qualitative research using a case study approach and the other, uh, which is me, uh, analyze the qualitative data collected through face-to-face -face interview held from July until September 2020. Uh, and the interviewers were divided into work of data, which uh, there are uh, individual and uh, institution and our community and also local communities that affected by hotels and apartments because uh, which between uh, warga budaya and local communities is uh, there are any connection and they build a network 
okay uh, and then uh, let's discuss about the result or my findings by taking the case of uh, Jogja Asap campaign the study shows that uh, warga budaya has become uh, as politics and the uh, process uh, uh, can be seen as follows uh, for the first one that uh, WP was initially reason as a uh, response to concern about the urban management of Yogyakarta. So in the beginning, it's not about the hotels and Jogja, Jogja Asad. Uh, in the beginning, uh, there are a move as a, a group about uh, their unrest about uh, Yogyakarta cities. Uh, the group, which is uh, cyclists and street artists, and in 2030, uh, they conducted a an event that called uh, Marti Kuto in Indonesia Marawat Kota or Maintenance City with uh, the, the title of this event is Empowered Communities to Improve Urban Space. And uh, by this uh, event, they name themselves as a network which Warga Budaya. Warga Budaya uh, is a manifestation of the spirit of self resilience and self-sufficiency uh, and Warga Budaya tries to highlight how people uh, don't always depend on the government. And uh, with this name, they can uh, bring uh, self resilience. Okay, uh, so uh, the, from the beginning, it's not about Jogja Asad. Uh, Jogja Asad uh, uh, emergence uh, in August uh, 2014 because in one village, which is uh, Miliran, uh, their uh, face uh, wells, their wells are drying up because of the hotel theft, and they respond. Uh, they they have an action, theatrical action, in front of the hotel, and because of this uh, event, uh, the term of the budaya asat is emerged, and then warga budaya join this network with Dodok Putra Bangsa. That is the first. Uh, individual that respond about hotel. So uh, in this uh, August 2014, the term of the jasad is much to respond the dryness of the villager wells due to the existence of hotels and apartments. And then uh, uh, there are uh, in campaigning of the jasad, uh, my research categorized as three steps. Uh, the first step is network building. WB uh, or Warga Budaya position himself as a fluid network that everyone can join the movement and there are no strict uh, roles or strict uh, uh, strict hierarchy because everyone can uh, can uh, move based on their role, even or it even or it's institution or individual. Uh, after they built a network, uh, Warga Berdaya also using the media. Uh, one of the project by Warga Berdaya was uh, they made a documentary film entitled Belakang Hotel. Uh, you can see on YouTube uh, their documentary movie that tells about how uh, local communities deal with the condition of uh, dryness of their wheels because of the hotels and apartments. And uh, besides of the made, they made a movie. They also uh, do a murals on the street on the Jakarta uh, that they voicing about Jogja Asad, about the threat of the hotels and etc. And then uh, after using the media, they also uh, encourage uh, community participation. Like I said before, uh, I inter I do interview with the local communities that affected by hotels and apartment. Uh, Warga Budaya boots uh, local community uh, participation in order to be able to speak out of their uh, environment. Uh, the action, uh, and then uh, from the next, from the last uh, part is uh, conclude. Uh, the whole process of Warga Budaya has carried out has become an illustration of how the sub politics works. Uh, this can be seen from the beginning that there is a, a threat of the water scarcity or water zero as risk due to the 
construction of hotels and apartment and this uh, condition i is called risk society because this threat is caused by human activities which is industrial uh, or specifically tourism industry process and because of this condition there are uh, community or individual that reflects of this condition and then move as a politic which as uh, informal politics presents in the midst of community for concern for the increasing risk that will be uh, borne by the community this politics moved by three steps like i said before for the first is network building and then they are also using the media to campaigning and uh, the third is they also encourage community participation uh, we beside that we be also empowers the villager or in jakarta called kampung uh, that network with it uh, we be builds a local community participation in order to be able uh, to speak out for their influence so uh, uh, villager in this kampung-kampung uh, can be voicing their unrest about hotels and empowerment and we will be an umbrella for this activism and providing a support system uh, by uh, that what that is needed by the community uh, a lot of communities is position a uh, warga bia as an intellectual actor intellectual actor uh, who can answer their concern concern especially about the impact of the hotel and apartment so this is the whole process of how uh, is we be uh, can be seen as a politics phenomenon based on uh, all respects uh, theory uh, and this is my uh, poster presentation and that's all uh, by me uh, thank you for your attention and see ya thank you thank you Saki for this wonderful presentation and um, this example of community mobilization and self-organized uh, groups uh, and how it's it grows into a whole network and a whole also uh, well-organized um, umbrella for uh, urban activism uh, that support you know the locals to defend and to have also a voice um, on the different you know development projects uh, happening within their um, within their area and at the same time also as you very well mentioned give them a voice but also allow for action um, so this is will be also I'm, I'm happy for that because, you know, it's not um, a coincidence uh, that I, I put this panel because it, they will all tackle uh, from different sides, uh, this part about, uh, you know, um, the, the voice of uh, inhabitants and civil society and uh, different actors in the way how, uh, you know, the environment is shaped and um, I'm pleased uh, to have with us as a second um you know um key speaker julia hartman uh she's a municipal uh, commissioner for housing and accessibility in the german university town of tubingen in refugee housing as a cooperative urban investment and i have also the pleasure to have also julia as a friend as well as the majority of the speakers she's also and it's good to know that she's also a very uh fearsome let's say um uh, activist. <laughs> so thank you, Julia, for for joining us. And um, yes, it's it's for you. Uh, you're muted, by the way. Oh. <laughs> um, your microphone is muted, Julia. So now yeah. you can hear me. Yeah, hear thank me. you, yeah. Saf, for the nice introduction. It's great to see you here again. And um, I'm going to share my screen now. And I'm I think you have quite a tight program, so I'll just launch right into my presentation, I think. So just give me a sec to find the right screen. Is it working now for you? Yes, perfect. Yeah, perfect. okay. Perfect. Go ahead. So yeah, as Insa have already said, I'm working in the small university town of Tübingen. It's 40 kilometers south of Stuttgart. I don't know, many of you probably don't know that area. It's a very high density town. It's got a big university, which is growing with lots of research departments, which are also growing and sort of growing into small local biotech firms. So there's a lot of pressure 
uh, development pressure on the small cities and despite that we try to sort of do no greenfield development within the last 20 30 years because around as you can maybe see there are these green hills which we're trying to protect as natural spaces um, so the municipality has been the main actor in the developing of new urban quarters and what have we've been trying to do is to develop these quarters on brownfield sites only so we try to acquire brownfield sites and develop them into new urban neighborhoods, which are also not monofunctional areas, which also have all sorts of services, shops and everything you need in terms of public spaces and other services in the area. So these have been the goals for the last 20, 30 years in terms of urban development for the city. Um, and the Tübingen model is quite a special one because the municipality of Tübingen is the main developer of these brownfield sites, though so the city itself acquires the brownfield sites and develops the whole development concept, the urban form and the development plan and manages the overall development of these urban areas and finances the development by selling building plots for a fixed price to a diversity of actors. And the main actors that we have been working with for almost 25 years now are citizens building cooperatives. They are our sort of key development actors that are developing their own small scale plots to like multifamily housing. They receive plot options for their different concepts like they have to apply for the city, we want to build on a certain plot and then the city looks at their concept and sees if it fits into the whole development of the quarter. And then it gives them the plot option and they have a lot of creative freedom within the development guidelines to then develop their own buildings. And in, in that kind of mix of and, and real diversity of actors, they manage to convert this very deserted brownfield sites into new sort of very lively and sort of um, small scale and diverse neighborhoods. Um, maybe I'll show you some picture first. So these were some military barracks. That's how they looked like in 1991. And um, after the development done by the city and by these like citizens building cooperatives, that's how it looks like today. So you see all these like small scale plots with lots of different buildings. Um, and these are all supported by these small scale citizens cooperatives. Maybe some words to the building cooperatives themselves, how it works. Often there's like a group of people, families and singles or and small businesses. If they want to have small businesses on the ground floor, they form a group and the group is then responsible for the whole planning and building of, of the new residential buildings. Of course, supported by architects and project managers, which, which by now have been very specialized in working with these kind of building cooperatives. And we get a really wide range from sort of low budget to high class, from self-organized to pre-structured groups that are building, as you can see here on the picture, maybe as well a little bit, a very diverse array of buildings. And for us, as a, from the perspective of the municipalities, the building, these building cooperatives are kind of no end in themselves, but for us, we see them as instruments to get really high quality buildings with low cost and with all the special qualities that these kind of citizens ideas bring with them. So that's maybe just as, as a precursor, how the city has been working in for the last 20 years and um, what happened in 2015, after we already had all this experience with how we want to develop our new urban quarters, we very suddenly, without actually having any planning or idea how to deal with it, we had the responsibility to house about 1,500 people sort of um, within the next two years, because first like people arrived and then they have to be registered and they go through a lengthy application process. And then after about two years, the municipality becomes responsible for housing these people. They spend about two years inside sort of larger refugee centers and then they get distributed to the different municipalities. That's how sort of the refugee asylum system works in Germany and the people who, who are allowed to stay for a larger or smaller amount of time or forever, they then are the responsibility of the municipality. So we knew we had some time, but not very much time. And as I already said, Tübingen has a lot of development pressure, housing prices are high and it's not an, the easiest task to find housing for so many people within such a short amount of time. 
So we were discussing within the municipality the strategy, what to do. The first idea was like, we just occupy all the available and affordable existing flats of our municipal housing company. But that kind of spelled social political disaster because it would also like politically mean people who come new into the country, they get all the housing and the other people who are already here and are also in need of affordable housing, there wouldn't be any left. And that would, of course, cause big rifts in society and would also not be a, uh, uh, very possible to welcome these people. Sort of. So, and then the, the second option was like most municipalities in Germany did to construct a small number of relatively large refugee camps with like um, structures which are meant to be temporary, but tend to like stay there for a long time. And we thought that was wrong in terms of refugee integration because you need big sites which are mainly outside the city, which don't, which don't have services, which are not integrated in, into the urban fabric. And also to, to construct these temporary residences, it's actually more expensive than constructing a, a more sustainable form of housing. So we decided on a decentralized concept where we selected about 50 plots which are left over in the cities, plots which had been so far difficult to develop or were too small to do anything with. And we also um, looked at available existing flats by private people that would rent their flats out to the city for a certain amount of time to house people. We had some quick and simple projects by the communal housing company. And the, but the main thing we did is to kind of adapt this tubing and model that I was just talking about to uh, the accommodation of refugees. So we were giving out plots for private and professional housing developers and said, we want these plots developed with a mixed occupation. We need permanent housing and about half of it has to be used for accommodating refugees, at least for the first 10 years. And so here you can see a map of how all these places were distributed across the city. I think we managed to get a quite an even distribution. So people weren't really concentrated in, in one space and they had the option to integrate in, in all these different quarters in Tübingen. We even managed to find spaces in, in the smaller villages to actually construct new housing, which you can see. I don't know if you see my cursor outside in smaller villages around Tübingen, but also of course, close to the center. So we try to transform these kind of experiences that we had to fit these new challenges. And we, we tried, as I already said, to, to find plots that were not previously allocated for housing, that but the, were already in municipal ownership that could be sold and developed relatively quickly. And again, we, we fixed the prices at the most possibly low level for these plots. And then we, we just um, selected the different concepts that were applying to, to use these plots. And we had about 110 applications, which we were very surprised about because we didn't know it's, of course, it's a difference to say, here's a plot for sale to build your own housing with your local group. And to say, here's a plot for sale, half of it has to be refugee housing, but it worked and people were really very much into it. And all these groups formed very quickly. So we managed to sell like um, 13 plots to this citizen cooperatives. Um, and we had quite different selection criteria from our normal development, because first of all is we had to be very quick because we needed, we knew in about two years, all this housing has to be completed and people have to be put up. So the question was how realistic and how fast can they build? Uh, but also what ideas for integration do these concepts bring to the table? Are they just um, building housing or are they thinking of ways that people can actually meet, that people can interact? How, how is the building integrated into the urban fabric? What is the added value for the neighborhood? Is, is there anything being offered for people who already live in the neighborhood as well? Um, what are the economic effects for the municipality? Is, are there any new businesses starting up? Like what, what's going to happen in these houses? And of course the question, what happens after 10 years after this refugee accommodation program is phased out? Are people, can they stay there? Will they become like renters of these flats? Or what's, <clears throat> what's going to happen then? So these were our criteria. And it, as I already said, then half of the housing had to be leased back to the municipality 
to, to be used as refugee housing for 10 years. And we tried to have a social mix from day one. So we had none of the buildings which has a single use as refugee housing. We always have other housing uses and other uses in the, in the housing as well. Um, and we were really surprised like how many ideas people came up with and how much money was also invested in these buildings. Like as a city, we would have never been able to, you know, to put up all the finances to put up all these buildings, but it was basically many, many citizens investing together in these different houses being built. Here you can see some at the side. I'll go into a few more examples of what kind of housing um, was developed later on. Yeah, so we ended up with sort of new visible and also permanent urban building blocks, which are here to stay and they're sort of long term affordable housing for refugees and for other people alike. So there's one example here. You can see a section through the house on top, you have a shared roof garden, you have student living, which is like shared flats shared by students. They have communal living spaces for students and refugees, you have family flats for larger refugee families. And you also have a public meeting room where I think by now there are many language courses happening there and sort of mothers meetings, like mothers with small kids that are, that are meeting in these areas and having different courses. Um, that's one of the building. Then we have another one where they have a wide mix of apartments. They have apartments for refugees, like families, flat shares, also individuals. Also some flats that people built and constructed for themselves, like they wanted to actually live in the houses that they were, they were financing. We have some micro apartments, I think for younger refugees that have been in kind of social care because they arrive without their parents. And after social care ends when they're 18 years old, they often have big problems finding housing so they can find housing there. And we also have a, a small project of affordable housing for single parents where they can live in a kind of flat share together. So that's another project. Then there's one project which also has student flat shares and family flats, um, but they're also arranged to find financing for a wood workshop, for a tailor workshop on the ground floor. Here you can see the sketch a little bit. They have some urban gardening area in the backyard, and they also arrange to have a social worker, which is permanently on place, who offers social program for these mainly traumatized families that are actually put up in these spaces here. Um, and we have one interesting project, which is financed not by sort of 10 or 15 people where each finances one flat, but we have one where we have more than 100 shareholders financing one building and to sort of um, say we are a political project, we want to involve as many citizens as possible to somehow identify with this new urban building block and to also identify with this idea that we are welcoming people and that we want to sort of meet and, and have a possibility for everyone to find housing. And they also have a large flexible commercial area where they're offering different activities for refugees, but also for people who live in the neighborhood as well. And what we also did parallel to that, because of course we knew for all the neighborhoods where these buildings were being put up, this meant big changes. All of a sudden your neighborhood changes, there are new people arriving, like the physical appearance of the neighborhood changes. And we knew we needed to sort of involve the neighborhood into this kind of development process. So we, we, we developed some formats of so-called city talks and neighborhood workshops. So we tried out some new formats of like a random selection of local participants where we didn't invite basically the whole neighborhood, but we did a random selection and wrote to people individually, would you like to come to discuss the subject of the changes in your neighborhood when new people will arrive and how do you want to live together was our lead question in these talks. And um, that worked quite well. We also network with existing neighborhood support structures and we kind of in these large groups, which also included refugees, but, but also these randomly selected neighbors, we developed different concepts for integrative urban spaces and services, services all under the question, what does it mean when new people come? What does it mean for our urban spaces and what kind of qualities do we need to be able to meet and, and to get along? And some of the resulting projects is just a list. 
One was, for example, in one of the neighborhoods, they made a list of all the usable spaces, all the publicly accessible spaces, but also all the spaces you can rent to have a birthday party or that you can go to. So, you know, people would have an idea of what spaces are actually usable and what are public and, and, and where you can meet. And then they also went into the planning, of course, with municipal support of new barbecue or play areas and some local group groups were founded that would care for local green spaces. And we also have actually two new neighborhood centers that were there were new local foundations that actually came out of these workshops that were then supported financially by the municipalities that actually built new neighborhood centers in terms of like there were language courses, all sorts of courses there, meeting places. One was in an old underused shop basically, which was then converted to this meeting center. But there were also some very simple things where people said, if new families come here, we have a we have a traffic problem, we need some new safe pedestrian crossings, you know? So also these the issues that people already had in the neighborhood could, could be talked about and, and solved sort of cooperatively. And then of course, there was quite a lot of events being planned by the people. We had some neighborhood celebrations, street parties out of one workshop actually came the question we need some intercultural training because sometimes we have problems understanding each other and we don't really know how to deal with each other so we we offered some intercultural training courses for the participants of the dialogues and also other people who then wanted to join um, of course a lot of the issues centered around most people that are coming out of Muslim religion, what does it mean for us? What is this religion like? Is it a dangerous thing or not? So we had a lot of talks around this, which were also very, very interesting exchanges. And we also found a lot of new members for permanent local refugee support organizations, which are now still supporting individuals and families, like individual people coming to the houses of families and helping them with all the bureaucracy or doing language classes with them and these kind of things. Um, so as a conclusion, these uh, citizens building cooperatives, we always see them as an important tool for urban neighborhoods, but we can also use them, which we now found out for sort of actual big tasks of social in integration. And it's still quite important that the city administration takes the lead as a main actor and the main thing that we have to do is the, basically the land management. We need to be make sure that the municipality has their own land, that they can basically decide what should happen on it. And they can decide which actor they invite to build. That is the main problem for many municipalities in Germany and probably all over, like is the land actually in municipal hands or is it in, in private hands? And these projects were all generally well received. Like I said, we had a lot of, um, support, but partly, as with any development project, there was intense local resistance, but we managed to kind of work around that by offering these kind of neighborhood talks and, and by offering all this involvement, we managed to simmer down all, all these problems in, in quite a short span of time, actually. And we managed to, as I said, to get a mix of housing and other uses within the buildings and also to really have um, some positive effect for the whole neighborhoods. So they, these houses with refugees living in them wouldn't be seen as a burden for the neighborhood, but more as a positive local addition somehow. And um, yeah, we will see how these projects evolve over time. I mean, now all of them have been standing for about three, four, five years, and um, most of them are really going strong. There are still a lot of activities there and, some are growing more and more here. You can see it's not a very good photo, but it's like a local tailor workshops where the students that live in the house meet with the women of the house and they're teaching each other how to sew and do little projects together. And yeah, and if all goes well, I think these houses will be a relevant long-term contribution to housing affordability because we also made sure that there are permanent rent caps on all the flats that are being built. So even if this 10 year lease time runs out, most of the flats will stay affordable. And as it looks like, most of the flats will also be rented to the people that are occupying them now. So yeah, so much for me, from me. <laughs> I think it was a quick ride through like a very large arc of very <laughs> difficult and complex subjects. Okay. So yeah, but I hope this can um, be a bit of inspiration on 
for at least from the terms of a munip municipality's perspective, what you can do when working together with, with citizens on these issues. And I think that oh, it's thank very, you. very, thank you, Julia, very much for this, uh, you know, uh, project uh, you are working uh, in. And uh, at the same time, we know how much is, is quite challenging and how big it is uh, to, to arrive to such, uh, you know, results. And in particular, uh, how also very challenging to get this integrated, you know, approach to be involving all the different, you know, stakeholders. And as you said, that they are key component, uh, very important for the success of success of such uh, project, which one of them is the land tenor itself, and that it should be um, privatization won't be, you know, helpful in such circumstances when we try to negotiate, leave room for also innovation, leave rooms for ideas, for creativity, and also put the people together. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, it will be very nice to have also after you the presentation of uh, Francesca. She recorded, she's not here with us today, but I mm -hmm. think it will join the same. Um, I will also look forward, I won't jump for the discussion to not overpass the attendees and their questions. So uh, please stay with us and then uh, we will go back to you with, with more questions. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thanks. I'll stay with you and say goodbye for now. Thank you, Julia. Thanks. So um, our next uh, key speaker is Francesca Loe. She's not with us today because she's also convening another uh, event. Um, so she's a project manager and team leader working at the municipality of Stuttgart in the Social Cities program. Uh, she's also an architect and urban planner in the background. Uh, she will present, um, you know, 13 minutes uh, that we recorded um, this week about the role of local grassroots communities in shaping the arrival and the settling and the eco duration of individuals and families who came as refugees or migrants. So I will be sharing my screen with you. And we will be able to watch together, share sound, and let me know if there is any problem in terms of sound. Can you see the full screen? I hope so. Yes. There you go. Hello, I'm Franziska Lauer. I'm an architect and urbanist um, currently based in Germany uh, in the southwest uh, in Stuttgart. I have studied architecture and sustainable urbanism in Stuttgart, Berlin and Cairo. And currently I'm working at the municipality of Stuttgart uh, in the social cities program. I am very happy to join this panel here. Um, more or less as um, someone sharing her experience on the whole notion of host uh, societies dealing with refugees and newcomers, uh, but rather from the civil society perspective. And um, this is where I would actually like to highlight the importance of the role of local grassroots communities in the host societies like uh, the German or the Southwestern German one, how what role this can play, because I think they are really shaping the arrival and the settling and the acculturation of individuals and families who came as refugees or migrants, which is really important when looking at the notion of this uh, panel, the forced displacement, and then especially the social integration. So I would like to rather share on the atmospheric setting that helps to decide whether integration is possible or happening or um, the, isola the isolation or marginalization is sneaking in. This is a very um, gray zone and they, there are institutional options, of course, to prevent or mitigate that, but also um, <coughs> simply uh, the act and the contribution of individuals being part of the whole society, knowing the, um, the context and the culture of uh, one's own society in being ready and interested to, to build a bridge or being that bridge that plays a major role. And when I'm trying to think of the positive things that can contribute to that, um, two examples come to my mind when, um, you know, especially examples that do not require much 
let's say, financial or administrative efforts. So basically being a citizen, being someone who observes what is happening, especially in the context of, of these major uh, migration and refugee flows affecting also, uh, you, especially Europe and, and uh, Germany. So the first one deals with the decentralized but organized support groups associated to refugee homes that we have um, now uh, here in, for example, in Stuttgart. The second one deals with the concept of the German association as an entity to provide social and atmospheric cultural and educational support. These are elements that uh, I have been involved with um, before, but also around 2015 when the major influx of um, people uh, and individuals and families to, to Europe came. So concerning the first one, um, in 2015 and onwards, um, especially around these um, merging refugee homes, um, so-called support groups, or in German, they're called um, Freundeskreises, uh, say literally translated into um, circles of friends. Yeah, They emerged around these refugee housing, often being rather low rise, uh, but multi-story structures, or they are repurposed former hospitals or similar buildings that had been vacant. And um, while it, let's say in, in short term housing, housing um, migrants and refugees in, in these uh, housing um, setups. And with, with, the, with this um, sudden influx of people in need of support, these circles of friends, they have um, emerged and they are more or less um, often managed or brought together by the management of, um, of these refugee homes, which are welfare and charity organization. Often, often they are Christian based uh, who worked in charity and welfare for, for many decades in Germany. And these groups, they often serve as a more or less informal, but very well organized connection to provide support, any support available to um, the refugees in, um, in, in, the, in the housing uh, units nearby, meaning neighboring families, neighboring German, German families, neighboring uh, German individuals, but also institutions, they can simply be a part of that, of that uh, group. So, and support here includes donating goods and services, such as helping out with, let's say, homework with the kids meeting, also the female residents, which is also always an important part at smaller social gatherings, let's say um, weekly brunches, or simply having conversations or um, enjoying common tasks to um, supporting paperwork and also providing translation. So these small little um, elements that in the after hours, uh, after a long day or uh, in the weekends uh, are able also for, um, let's say the average um, neighbor in, in, uh, of, of um, a refugee home. This is the first one. And the second one links to the concept of association as an entity. So it's a civil society organization, uh, which is very bottom up. It can be founded by various um, citizens and individuals uh, in Germany. And they are um, legally registered entities with a social purpose, with a nonprofit purpose. And so also these, uh, such an association that can easily be created, uh, I, I have been a part of um, that provides social, practical, atmospheric, cultural and educational support also on a very one-by-one um, -by -one basis. And I think this is Again, also something that uh, is an important part of the urban society, of the urban um, support system. So, and um, uh, so I'm sharing the experience as a member, and also formerly I enjoyed being a board member of the association. And this one is uh, one example is called Hiwar, which uh, basically means dialogue in Arabic, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, and this association with this idea of the dialogue was founded 15 years ago by like-minded Arab and German individuals and um, and it is until today always uh, boarded so the board is always consisting of German and um, Arab individuals of different backgrounds of younger and also older generations and often the members they know both contexts they have already navigated um, through being a stranger somewhere else relying on um, someone else's support to 
to kind of um, navigate them being there and giving that back and also um, to, to basically very pragmatically provide the support um, to others. That's, that's one of the major elements of this association. Originally, and this emerged throughout the years, uh, originally uh, the association wants to be a bridge builder by more or less promoting and maintaining the, di the dialogue between German and Arab culture. So it starts from the culture, but the culture is not just, let's say, liter liter uh, literature and arts and fine arts, but the culture also means how you, how you welcome someone. And so it's the commonalities, the social interests, the exchange based on, on uh, the commonalities and differences in language, which can be um, a fascinating, beautiful exchange stranger but should not leave the stranger and that's a beautiful concept of an association like that the member base is not very large it's 30 30 members but uh, they are there is an activity in it that is basically activating the network around these members so um, especially now with prejudices, misunderstandings, and even the fear, the bridge building and creating very, very pragmatic and simple uh, uh, friendships um, based on these meetings on a regular basis that uh, we noticed has helped a lot, especially since 2015. And one of the very simple elements, as uh, I already hinted at, are um, monthly social gatherings. They are called uh, Stammtisch, that's a German term uh, for, yeah, let's say a regular table in a pub in a classic way where everyone always meets. It's, it's, it's uh, actually a really important element for everyone in the community to be at the same time once a week or once a month at that place and then to be social. So this, um, this concept has turned into that uh, um, Arab German concept of, of the Stammtisch to just gather and exchange, do music uh, or just, um, uh, yeah, play games or uh, read poetry. So it starts like that. And with 2015, this, uh, these elements of the social, uh, this, this uh, Stammtisch with reading the poetry inv uh, invited even um, people and uh, refugees and incomers to just sit together and have some sense of normality. So, and how it works is basically, as I said, uh, members are being invited by a email but also it's being advertised in the newspaper. Um, this advertisement uh, citywide in the newspapers also strongly supported by actually an umbrella association uh, here, for example, in Stuttgart, where um, associations that um, uh, bring or make visible the, the diversity of the, of the Stuttgart or the uh, Southern uh, Southwestern society, to, to make that visible, make bring this to the foreground and invite um, the broader um, community to be a part of that. So they, they are always open. So that umbrella organization supports that uh, communication and also advertises these meetings. And so what also um, evolved with this association, the small member based association was that um, not just the social gatherings were a helpful tool to create some sense of exchange, uh, some sense of normality and uh, yeah, um, uh, let's say uh, traveling of, of ideas and tips and uh, joint, joint activities even. Uh, also, um, they, um, newcomers were also mentored by some of the families who volunteered to either ho uh, host um, um, incoming uh, refugees in their homes or by supporting them to provide some housing and also to provide, for example, apprenticeship uh, positions somewhere in, in the firms or in the administration they are part in. So these are very uh, low threshold, but um, uh, very, let's say, effective elements of, of making someone uh, slowly arrive and feel, feel um, let's say, listened to and just being there. So to, to ease one, the newcomer's feeling um, in terms of their 
liminal uh, situation one is in when wanting when arriving somewhere wanting to settle down and so it's that very active simply providing everyday pragmatic support that um, characterized especially the years since 2015 now with the pandemic of course this is a different challenge now everything moves uh, virtually and this also continues this way but um, networks they have always in parallel been um, virtual so this continues and what I can perhaps basically say to wrap it all up um, is that these two small examples, they are now positive examples, uh, but they show um, they are not spatial interventions per se. They are a part of the urban space, uh, and, but they are, of course, not a built intervention, but they show the social side of urban interventions, the side that is doable after work, during the weekends, um, that support the shape of a very common daily activity. And this even can have that um, an impact on a stranger's feeling of for arrival. Yeah? And so I hope that um, these simple concepts um, are replicable even in the settings of other contexts uh, that self-organized, or I'm sure that it is self-organized um, um, groups to provide support on a temporary basis and ideally growing into something of a long-term uh, relationship with um, whoever has arrived newly and is about to stay and um, be part of, of a community, a broader community. So um, we thank uh, Francesca for this uh, presentation um, and especially, you know, emphasizing on the key role of civil society and self-organized groups in uh, the whole, you know, um, let's say strategies uh, to welcome uh, refugees and to help, you know, this process um, of integration. Um, the things that we can also keep in mind, there are some key, uh, you know, sentences that she said, uh, phrases about the culture of welcoming, uh, that uh, culture is also how you can, or how you welcome, and also uh, that civil society and these groups are, uh, you know, bridges, that, that they, they are the one, the cement that maintain also the social spheres and, um, the things that we cannot see beyond the physical. Um, so thank you uh, for all the speakers and for their wonderful interventions. And I open now, you know, the panel for um, questions. We have already um, one question or two, I think, for Sadiq. Uh, the first one is how did the local government respond to the WB movement and uh, Joga Assad campaign? And the second one, do you think the findings, conclusion of your research can also be relevant for the refugee local community relations as discussed throughout the session, perhaps as a form of urban activism? And if you can share some other reflections. So the floor is yours, Sadiq. So let's say, just seeing him, maybe he disconnected. Uh, no, he's he's back. So give him two minutes. There you go. Okay. Uh, sorry for my unstable. No problem. Do you want me to repeat the questions? Uh, no, it's not. I have right the uh, question for the first one is about how did the local government respond to the to this campaign uh, in my research uh, i found that uh, the uh, local government especially city government uh, pemerintah kota yogyakarta uh, has responded this is this uh, campaign or this movement with uh, issue of a decree of for a moratorium hotel a moratorium hotel means that uh, temporary suspension on building permits for all types of hotels for the periods of, uh, uh, I don't remember, I don't really remember, but uh, in two years. So there are, there is a rules that a temporary for suspension in a hotel construction, but uh, and the, the interesting part is, however, uh, the hotel development proponents had previously obtained permits before 
uh, this rules is uh, start uh, were able to go ahead with the construction of the hotel. So basically, uh, this uh, warga budaya call this rule is relevant uh, moratorium because uh, in fact uh, in the hotel construction keep growing in this in this two year because uh, they done their permission before this rule is starts. So uh, uh, actually, this is is a uh, relevant uh, rules rules, and that is the response by this government. And the second one is about reflection about uh, this relation locals and uh, refugee. Okay, uh, to me as a Yogyakarta citizens in Indonesia, refugee is not a mainstream is issue because I think uh, there is just a little people as a refugee in here, especially in this city. But uh, if I have to reflect this issue based on my discussion about uh, urban movement, one thing that uh, can be discussed is that local communities or this local movement uh, can be utilized as a medium to advocate uh, about uh, refugee interest and can help by this urban movement like Warga Budaya. So uh, Warga Budaya and this local communities can be used as a medium to uh, voicing or advocate uh, refugee uh, issue or refugee interest if there are any uh, based on my reflection uh, also there is a necessity to mainstreaming uh, about this issue of refugee to the Yogyakarta citizen but as I said before that uh, this issue is not uh, common for Yogyakarta citizen but uh, I need uh, there is necessary to mainstreaming this issue so uh, in the future uh, the relation between local communities and refugee can be established and urban activism can be can be used as a medium to voicing or uh, complaining uh, about the refugee uh, interest. Yeah, that's all my answer. Thank you. Thank you, Seki. Thank you for your answer. Um, we have uh, questions for Yulia. Uh, the first one is about you know refugees are newcomers who need time to adapt. In your opinion, how to facilitate refugees? sense of belonging to this new setting or refugee housing. Um, the second one is, uh, in your opinion, is this type of mixed population housing suitable to be applied in transit countries and cities? Yeah, thank you for the questions. Um, I think the first question, I mean, of course, um, there's also a part of bureaucratic setting that housing cannot solve you know like in the in the way like refugees in germany they're being allocated to certain cities where they sometimes cannot move freely you know so in in terms of what their actual situation is it's not always easy you know to feel like a citizen with equal rights and equal possibilities. And there, you know, in terms of what we can do by providing housing is at least to provide housing to an equal standard, living standard that everybody else has to provide housing, which is as connected to the urban services as everybody else is, and to provide possibilities for local meeting and local engagement by having neighbors which are interested in the people that live next to you by having like structures and services that will help you to understand the new situation around you by offering language classes by taking the kids to certain events by having the possibility to go to a sewing class with your neighbor and all these kind of things that at least help you to you know to feel as an equal citizen taking part in this kind of social events and and becoming more acquainted to sort of the the local setting in in the whole but of course like as a as a municipal actor we always always see um what what other hurdles you know are there for people to to feel like like equal citizens and that we cannot solve but at least we try to provide a housing uh, situation that, that gives these possibilities to people so um the second question was the about question? more the, about the transit. Okay, well, um, I mean, I'm not a refugee researcher very much, and I'm not sure if the concept of transit country 
is really, I don't know how useful it is. I mean, people get stuck in transit countries often for a long, long time because of the legal situation, because of, you know, because of thinking this is a transit countries, but not being able to either go back or to move further on. So I think any kind of housing situation should be seen as potentially a long term and not a temporary situation. So in that sense, of course, it would be great if we had enough, like if every place had enough spaces and flats, which are like the ones in Tübingen to put people up. But of course we see how difficult it is for municipalities to even get their hand on, on land to develop for these kind of projects. So I guess it really hinges on um, uh, the municipality and the sort of the local funds to be able to provide this kind of housing. We, I think, I think it, it would still make sense as a transit place, you know, why shouldn't you live in a flat for, I mean, a transit place is never a few months, no, it's always like a longer time, at least what I know from kind of refugee movement and these places tend to get, tend to be, people tend to get stuck a lot. So I think it makes sense to, to not think about um, temporality, but to thinking about how can I make a home wherever I am and how can I be welcomed wherever I am and how can I get local connections and integration wherever I am, it be it for six months or for two years or for five or forever, you know. Yeah. Very so, well said, Julia. There yeah. is a third one. Uh, it's called some communities have a very strong communal culture and therefore community public open space could be very important. Do you think it's important to consider this is um, in planning for the housing spaces? And if so, in the context of refugee housing, how does it or mm -hmm. should it be reflected in the design of the planning process? Yeah, I think um, in terms of um, cultural differences, what we're trying to do in, in Tübingen, I think we, we tend to always have a big view or, or take a big importance on, on public space being provided and also our, our urban planning tends to involve sort of semi-public courtyards where housing are grouped around a common courtyard where like, I don't know, probably 30 or 50 parties, probably more than 30, uh, share a common courtyard, which is sort of semi-private, where we tend to also try to arrange some quieter spaces, some play areas, some whatever. But we do find, of course, that there is there are cultural differences. For example, um, the most problems actually didn't come from what you know, like what people feared first. The, the, the biggest fear in all the neighborhoods were all the young Muslim men coming to the country, you know. And what we what we ended up with, the main problem was, was all the little kids being playing unsupervised in, in the court areas. This is something that the Germans are not so used to, that young kids are being let out unsupervised to play. And of course, they're being loud and they're being rough and all this. But actually, it was quite funny, everybody being afraid of all these evil men. And then in the end, like it was the little kids that ended up being, being the problem and the noise of the little kids and how to deal with them. So that was quite funny. So in terms of public spaces, it was more more often a matter of how do you know, like who's supervising the kids? Like how can we make like offers for the kids to to you know to to play like with a social worker or to to be more involved like you know in in activities that wouldn't sort of disturb their neighbors so much and these kind of things tended to be more of an issue what tends to be an issue is more like the flats that was an interesting thing that we learned that the germans like the new thing for the last 10 15 years is having open kitchens like kitchens which open to the living area and sort of as a family arrangement, as daily life in a flat, tend to, there tend to be cultural differences. Like you, you're in the kitchen or you're in the in the living area, and having these two together tends to be a problem. So we had a few flats where all of a sudden, like walls were being built in which didn't fit with the structural requirements of the buildings, and then we had to make sure that this this would kind of um, not cause cause big problems. So I think in in the future, these are more things that we will watch out for, like what are the actual sort of everyday requirements in, in the individual flats. But I think in terms of public spaces, it's less a requirement of, of, of providing even more public space, but like thinking how, how can, can the use of the public space be managed in a, in a more sort of um, cooperative way, I think. But I think most of these places have found solutions by now, and I haven't heard in the last two or three years of any major trouble, actually. So, um, 
yeah while you're talking the questions come yeah. still pop in so the yeah. other one is about the mosques and prayer rooms and halal food yeah. near the refugee accommodation if uh, there is a mosque in the area how did the local community respond to it where there is, there is um, any xenophobic mm. xenophobic reaction to these uh, sites yeah i mean i i already said like in in the beginning there was in from some some part of the neighborhoods a big fear of the muslim men coming to i don't know molest the german women and stuff like this and this basically all died down because people realized oh there are no men coming to molest women they're like families with lots of children and it's not actually what we expected so i think there was a lot of like fear in the beginning but it ended up like being completely unfounded, I think, or very much unfounded, at least in what's happening in the actual neighborhoods where, where, we, where these buildings were, were being built. And in terms society, of... In, hmm? Yeah, sorry, it's just I yeah. jump in, in. Is the civil society helped in within that, with this, you know, to, to, to realize from um, the different, you know, uh, inhabitants that their fears are not founded? Is there something mm. that helped in terms of you know, um, campaign of awareness or working with these, uh, you know, uh, during these talks, let's say, or the mm. small workshops, uh, mm. did that help? Yeah, I mean, some interesting, I think a few uh, interesting things in these conversations were also people realizing like their own biases. I mean, it was mainly, I mean, of course it's not, I mean, this refugee influx wasn't like the first influx of people with Muslim, a religion. We already have a lot of Turkish people in the area. We already had a, have a lot of Iranian people in the area. So we have, I mean, it's it's not like we're not used to different cultures in our city. There are existing mosques, there are existing prayer rooms already, which are now of course being being used more. But it was kind of interesting in these talks because we invited like people that had been there for a few years already, or maybe for 10 years already, you know, like from these migrant communities. To these talks and it was interesting to see their different perspectives because most of the Germans that came to these talks said we're so integrative and we're so working together so well and we have no problems with all the foreigners and it's all great and the foreigners told very different stories you know about not feeling accepted about being held you know being thought of the cleaner woman like wherever they work even though they're actually working in a high management position but because they have a headscarf people think they're the cleaner you know like these all these kind of little stories that it told about how people are still not really being integrated so it was more an awareness campaign about how do we actually treat these newcomers and how do they feel in response and what do we still need to learn about them and about each other which was interesting and we didn't really have but of course they wouldn't come to these talks you know if, if you're invited to a talk where you talk with people from the migrant community and you talk with people that have newly arrived then if you're full-on fascist and racist you won't come you know so we didn't get these people of course you know they wouldn't participate in any of the talks but luckily in Tübingen, they are a very small number and they don't really pose a problem in there are other places in Germany where refugee uh, housing has to be policed, you know, has to be policed by the police to, to, to be secure because people come and, uh, and try to light fires and like try to really attack people living in there. We did not have these problems here in Tübingen, which is lucky in the way. So, yeah, I mean, and yeah, in, in terms of sort of the, uh, the religious services, there are existing mosques and existing structures. And of course, there have been discussions around it. I remember there was one big scan scandal, local scandal, where I think the local imam of the mosque, they, they, he came to one of these talks, one of the neighborhood talks, and he invited everybody to come to his place and to see the mosque and to be and, and then people came and there was this like local women's organization that also came some feminist organization and they found some books by some local whatever imam which was which is very conservative and basically well very patriarchic and sort of not not very feminist and then there was kind of a big scandal about it, thinking about do we have to, what are these people actually up to? Like, what are they trying to teach our children? Do we want this? And out of this came a big, big series of interreligious talks and trying to heal these rifts and trying to understand each other. And, and um, 
but that's um, I think it's an ongoing discussion it will not end I mean they're always kind of um, you know negotiations of how sort of radical are the imams that are being sent from abroad to teach here you know how can we have a local religious education which takes which takes into account sort of equality of gender and, and sort of democratic principles you know this is a big much larger discussion which like is much bigger than refugee housing only of course and this will not stop i mean this isn't this is an ongoing thing but it was kind of like some of these discussions were kicked off in this in this neighborhood rounds as well definitely it needs a collective effort i think and a definitely. lot of you know from different mm -hmm. perspective and also this idea of, of the process which is very crucial it's not it's an open-ended, um, you know, um, process, which all the time um, I will jump also to to Sakib, uh, what he's talking about, also mm. the mobilization of, you know, uh, groups and dwellers um, to to also uh, around a common interest and uh, how they can empower each other and move forward towards that. But I think also linked it to, uh, for example, the um, the different, you know, example that uh, Francesca said. It's about creation of dialogue. And I think this mm. is very important, dialogue, discussion, getting to know each other. It's not about, you know, tagging uh, mm. people as much as being able to understand both sides and to understand that in a certain way, uh, maybe there is a way and other, um, let's say, methods to live together. And I like the question that you also ask to people is how they can perceive and how they can think about living together and what mm. does that mean? And I think this is could be something that all the time we look towards it by um, at the same time also mobilizing the enough resources mm. towards it because all what we are saying now it's not something that it's, it's costless it's something that requires a lot um, mm -hmm. um, and and located probably budget and uh, I keep also saying that also the government has a key role uh, mm. to play a new role to play within the whole this complex you know system. The whole world now is changing. We 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 come up to a new era, you know, of of um, mm. nomadism, whether is is forced or not forced, and this is leads to the fact that um, we add on already the challenges uh, mm. of of urbanized, you know, countries where they have already to deal with a lot of uh, urban challenges. We have also this a new demographic and new uh, groups of of communities that needs also to be uh, to be handled. Um, so thank you very much for, for this panel. It was really a great, um, you know, um, insight about um, community and civil society mobilization and also some example of the housing, uh, I mean, uh, solutions towards that. Um, um, we will be, uh, if you can stay with us, we, we are almost um, finishing also our, our whole thematic session. Uh, we will have, uh, I have the pleasure to have with us um, uh, Rasha Rus, uh, she's a civil engineer, project manager, and initiator. Um, uh, she used to work with UNHCR Urban Development Program in refugee hosting areas, um, and later managed the portfolio of economic inclusion of refugees in Egypt in displaced um, place making and community organization experience of the refugee hosting area in Cairo. So, uh, hi, Rasha. Thank you for your time. And we know that uh, you are in Toronto now. So it's very, you were with us since, uh, since 3 a.m. in the morning. Uh, thank you for your time and uh, commitment. So the, yes. it's for you, please. Good, good morning for those who have morning. Good afternoon for those who have afternoon. And it's still 5 a.m. In, in my time. And it's a pleasure to be here. Pleasure to see some of the faces that uh, participated in shaping my journey of education. To see Julia, to see, of course, uh, uh, Insaf, thank you for the invite, and to see Francisca and the others. It's uh, interesting to also go back to all these different cases while I'm also embarking on my uh, PhD and uh, like work with this uh, Canada Excellent Research Center currently. So it's a pleasure to be with you back and to feel also energized. So it's actually specifically a, a thrilling uh, opportunity for me to, uh, to uh, be in, in direct contact with a group of students and a group of 
uh, new scholars who are uh, looking at different cases for their country, for the reception and for the accommodation of refugees, be, the, be that in a transitional uh, kind of setting or be that uh, as an asylum place for them. And I wanted to put together something that would maybe um, transfer some of the learnings that we have had during the last seven, eight years of working with refugees, basically in Cairo. And this is how I put um, a kind of a, a presentation together that would introduce you into a glimpse of uh, how refugees formulate their um, spaces in Cairo and how they navigate the city different spaces. And I'm trying to share. Yes, and here we go. Okay. Do you see my screen, this one? Uh, yes, we saw the InDesign file. Uh, now it's unshared again. So you yeah. can share. Yeah. Take your time. Uh, we still have uh, plenty. Yeah, it's the PDF file. So <laughs> mm -hmm. there you go. And full yeah. screen. There you go. Uh, it's here, full screen mode. Uh, you see the, we, if you go back, you go down the same panel, read more. Yeah. And there is full screen, you know, down. Yeah, down. exactly. Yeah, there you go. Perfect. So, um, you know, maybe you, you guys can draw some parallels to Jakarta. I'm sure a um, mega city like Jakarta has its own also specific spaces of accommodating refugees. Uh, I've tried a little bit to, um, to give you a glimpse on everything. Every single neighborhood in Cairo or in any other city in this world needs quite a lot to talk about when it is about, of course, receiving per refugees or it's about the production of space and the appropriation of spaces by its also local residents. Yet I thought I would put together something that might help you brainstorm further for Jakarta and other cities in Indonesia. So first of all, I wanted to, with you to uh, set the scene of like refugees being active Sorry, navigator Asha, I think of- we are frozen for a while. Yeah. So hold on. Yes. Now. For me, it's fine. I can hear everything fine, actually. Yes, just yeah. please. Yeah, there you go. You're back. You're back. So, so it's, yeah. We stopped when you were comparing that we will find many resemblance in terms of spaces that accommodate refugees in, in, in Jakarta as well. Yeah, so maybe that was the Dublin. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so basically, we don't um, like we need to also think about refugees as active and effective navigator of choices, not only as passive victims who are looking for choices. They are actually actively engaged in making choices for themselves and in engages, engaging in processes of emplacement and of placemaking. And also, it's also, for the social integration discourse in general, we tend to always um, think of refugees as subjects for our assimilation and our approaches towards integration and assimilation, while they have their own resistance to that. They have their own choices of being also uh, engaged in their, the processes of engagement, in the processes of uh, integration, and to which limit they need to get integrated between brackets. So, so I just wanted to have that uh, quotation at the beginning of my presentation, because I really like that we think of uh, the struggle to make a place of, in the world and not only to make a home, but like finding meaning and recognition is important for all of us. So finding that place in the world is very important part of our journeys when we are displaced or where we are just residents in any place here or there. 
So as I am going to focus on Cairo, then I will start first with Egypt. And you know, if you look at Egypt as a country with its strategic location, Egypt and Cairo specifically have been uh, like one of the oldest uh, centers for reception of urban refugees specifically in the world. And they have received over time a wide range of refugees from different Sub-Saharan, West African, and also re more recently from the Middle East. And uh, as a quick chronology of refugees arriving in Cairo, you ha we have this timeline that shows us like some of the Armenian refugees who came to Cairo at the turn of the 19th, 20th century, and then many others who came over time. I have brought this, um, like uh, this is a reference uh, timeline, yet I had to add on top of it, the other refugees who came to Cairo, like Sudanese and Southern Sudanese and Ethiopians and Somalis and Eritreans. So actually there is a quite an interesting mix of refugees that passes through Egypt. And as the case in, uh, Indonesia, usually they are perceived as transitional. And like what Julia just said, transition can go for a lifetime. Sometimes for some people, it, it could take a period of 20 years and more. And people can live in transition and in temporariness in weight of a settlement somewhere else, either resettlement or going somewhere for actually the rest of their lives. So it's not as easy as we can imagine. A transitional place, um, I would prefer to call it a place of asylum, whatsoever asylum is. And then when we look at this chronology, we can see that actually Egypt itself internally had a lot of flows of internal displaced people. And we don't need to internally displaced people. So we don't need to also dismiss that part because of course with the transnational movements now because of the nation state uh, way of thinking that we have come to be in, it's important to think of, tra of transnational movements but also the, the experience in its emotional, psychological and sometimes social uh, weight is mostly similar for those who are displaced internally. Of course, we cannot talk about legal because usually if they are citizens of the same country, then they have legal rights, but yet maybe socially they have the same issues and challenges to integrate, right? So this is a map of Cairo. And you know, if you look at the parts that are in the middle that I have a gray color. These were the built up areas of Kairos in 1950. And the city grew over time. And the growing of Cairo also was associated with the build up of modernist new cities that were scattered here and there in the desert. And it ended up with eight new satellite cities. And these eight new satellite cities that you can see in this drawing spreading over like a huge, of course, area because you can see the scale of 30 kilometers. So between 6th October, which is the one to the left, uh, like bottom, and Asher min Ramadan, which is the one on top um, right, it's almost 90 to 100 uh, kilometer. So it's a massive uh, area. So I can just want, I just want you to imagine yourself somebody coming to settle in such a city that have really diverse spaces of accommodation, also very interesting variety of options. So it's quite, um, it's quite, um, like difficult to pick one space in such a city. So if we look at the like popular spaces of settlement for refugees in Cairo, you see that actually, it actually is very different according to the nationality and the background of the refugees and the times in which refugees came. So that their dispersion has taken really different um, trends over time. And when Syrian refugees and before them, Iraqi refugees came to Egypt, the trends have changed and they started to be more accommodated in the newly established formal, between brackets, formal cities than in informal settlements. For your information, informal settlements in Egypt constitute a very important uh, housing supply uh, 
sector. And like more than 58% of Karines, Egyptians live in informal settlements. So we're talking about a massive uh, accommodative area for Egyptians. And thus, we still see more uh, refugees of African origins, more refugees from Sub-Saharan and some of the West African countries, of course, together with migrants from these countries, because we have to mention that Egypt also is a receiving pot for many uh, economic migrants. So uh, these are more mingling in these spaces, which are the inner city existing city districts than in the uh, new cities that are spread across like a huge massive area. So if we look at the urban spaces of Cairo in different spaces, I just want to like I have picked these photos on purpose because you know even with such a small stand that has a shawarma put on coal and like in a clean setting in some of the informal areas, it's a, of course, it's a way of reclaiming this space in front of the shop. The first photo that I had put on the presentation that showed some vegetables in front of a small housing is also in a way, a kind of um, a way to uh, do hyper local adjustments and adaptations to actually claim and um, uh, organize the space in a special way that is specific to these types of to, to specific type of refugee, like the Syrians who want specific types of of vegetables for their pickles, and they actually have grown them in Egypt and have created the whole uh, like supply chain of these uh, types of vegetables that they need a specific taste of. So they created a taste ad adjustment supply chains. And also they created all the backward and forward linkages for the economic uh, production of such small businesses. So, I mean, these are small businesses, the appropriation of spaces that take place. Like I, I was very much interested to listen to Julia's story of like the partition walls that were built inside some of the homes, because we can see a lot of such small things taking place on the dwelling um, like level and also on the semi private and semi-public and public levels in Cairo. Of course, the negotiation space of the spaces is larger when informality is there. So you can negotiate some of the out, out of your home spaces, and then you can see some adaptations that are maybe tiny, but they actually translate to us um, a message of reclaiming spaces, of resisting the like, that also marginality that is taking place. In order for people to develop some small economic activities, they need to resist their marginal sometimes uh, locations on their city fringes. And thus they start to actually do these appropriations to bring in infrastructure at the local, very local level infrastructure, not in big terms, in these marginalized spaces. So Hyperlocal activities happen on all these different levels, and they actually are usually empowered by civil society and local NGO and other structures, like, like running a daycare, operating um, a small uh, uh, like bakery for a specific type of bread, usually are supported by local structures, because in these areas you cannot do such works on your own, there are always power structures that you need to negotiate. These power structures might be formal, like when you have the government or the municipality taking care of the presence of refugees in the case of Germany, but on the local levels in Cairo, where there is a great absence of formal structures, there are alternative structures that actually come into the fore. And then refugees, and asylum seekers and displaced people and others even from the locals need to negotiate these structures. And this is also part of their negotiation of the social space, spatial city structures that you see here and there done in different creative ways across the city. So, and as we are glimpsing, so I thought I would show you some of how the background of the refugee 
uh, would influence their image of the place of refuge or the asylum place, or even the transition place of asylum, whatever you want to call it. Any place that you kind of aim to find uh, sanctuary in is usually influenced by all the background information you have got about the space you're going to and your own experience in urban settings if you're from an urban setting or sometimes from a rural setting. So, like this is an image that was imagined by one of the refugees of the 6th of October city, which was like one of the main recipient uh, settlements in Cairo to re Syrian refugees before he had ever seen it. And he imagined a place that is faith-based and that was also repeated by uh, Francisca when she talked about the role of churches and uh, Julia about some of the, the faith-based structures. So faith-based structures everywhere play a very important role in receiving and dispersing refugees. And usually they actually form focal meeting nodes for them, especially when we talk about the developing world where like structures like municipalities, urban administrations, other uh, uh, administrations like or even civil society presence is not as visible as such structures. So these structures form important nodes for uh, the refugees to start from in a way. And here I have the example of a mosque, but in other districts in Cairo, Syrian who have a Christian background had to go to churches or clubs that were associated with churches and to get networking, uh, connect, like to get connections from there to actually find housing and found, find other support systems. And then if this, this city is located here and the, like if you look at the map, you can see that the green dot is the airport. So, and the city that where refugees are going mostly is on the other side of the Nile. So this is the Nile River. And it is indeed not a classical port of arrival, like in, in, in kind of classical also thinking terms. So it's not like a place where you come to the city and then you directly can go to. It's somewhere where you need to travel to arrive. And thus there is always an interplay of push and pull factor that bring people into some areas and push them out of other areas. And usually some of the pull factors can be so powerful to the fact that people can travel and go and change and actually move from one place to another. And that important like push or uh, pull factor could be first supply of housing, as was mentioned. So supply of ho housing is a key determinant of where to go. And then comes other aspects. If you have a community there, if there are schools for your children, if you have like the capacity to work and not work. So all this you can weigh differently according to different also conditioning factors, but supply of housing is critical. And in Cairo, you know, maybe Julia can also dwell more on that. The supply or the available housing is quite massive. Available housing. I insist on the word available and not supply because some of the housing is not put in, not a lot of the housing is not put into the market for rent or for selling. So it's not supply, it's just available. So, and you have a lot of available housing. So you don't have a problem of provision of housing for refugees. It's the last problem of organizing, having affordable one, and also maybe supporting the control of the market because it's so elastic to the extent that, you know, in some of the studies I conducted, it was just enough for people to book their flights from a city, a specific city in Syria called Homs for, and then the real estate market in a certain district in 6th of October, which is the second district where, district where people from that same city come from, rise. The same moment, because they know it's like connections that actually are based on digital connections, like uh, Jay's presentation today, have already influenced the real estate market before these people had 
arrived even. So, and these connections also show you that the drop of the housing, um, like rental values, when people started to leave to Europe in 2014 and 15 by sea, were directly dropping. And the change of the landscape and the, like, the dis dispersion of people among different districts in 6th of October was huge only because of uh, like the availability of trafficking, the availability of smuggling over the sea. So if you look at 6th of October, you can see everywhere. If you look uh, on Google and write 6th of October city Syrians, you will see this buzzing uh, coffee shops and city center that was, of course, after the Syrians had arrived, becoming more of and more of an urban uh, node and also an urban uh, uh, center for economic activity. Syrians who came to Egypt specifically had very strong background in negotiating urban economies. So they managed to help Egypt uh, bring urban development into underutilized new cities, because as you see, all these new cities in Egypt were built and they were to cater for Egyptians who would move from their original traditional uh, like informal areas and other districts and live in this desert uh, cities, but it never happened. People still mushroomed their informal settlements and lived in the hearts of the cities where they have traditionally lived. And these cities were never able to accommodate a, a good number of people. Like the occupancy rate were never so good. So when the Syrians came, they started to actually stimulate urban development in these areas. And so were the Iraqis. While we see, and you will see with me a different story for refugees who come from Sub-Saharan and West Africa, because basically they have less experience in negotiating urban economy. They come from rural areas and their capacities of negotiating an economy like an economy of the city are less. You know, the Syrians who came to Egypt, they came by plane and they came from major cities in Syria, like Damascus and Aleppo, which are cities of actually trade and urban, buzzing urban economies. So as you saw, and we have already discussed this, that this purging happened from these important nodes, which a mosque or a church or any faith-based structure plays a very important role in. And then, like these meeting notes as well. If you look at this picture, actually I meant to add it because of this lady who sits to the right hand side, who is a veiled lady and she is Syrian. In some of the well-off and affluent districts in Egypt, it's, um, it's kind of perceived that, you know, a middle class do not sit on the grass, do not sit by the fountains and their approach to like the outdoors to the outdoors is very different from Syrians. So that uh, part in one of the, uh, these compound cities or like walled cities that are, have a privatized uh, urban administration, like Rehab is one of the famous cities, Syrians have changed that, have started to use the public spaces differently. And their approach to public space is usually appreciative of public space. They like to do a lot of, um, of picnics, be them from middle class, lower class, whatsoever. So the city administration had, had have had issues with this actually, because the, some of the Egyptians complained about the use of public spaces by the Syrians. And so we need to understand also that in privatized spaces, uh, public participation could be limited by the, the, the kind of the extortion type of administration that takes place because you pay for your security, you pay for everything and you can control uh, other people's way of living by just going to the city administration, which is a private one and saying, you know, it doesn't fit us to see people sitting on grass and doing picnics in our public spaces, for example. If we go to a different uh, story of Sudanese and Somalis in Cairo, we see that they actually appropriated and worked on hybrid um, 
kind of city notes and uh, hybrid scapes of the city with Egyptians in a way that allow them to congregate and do economic activity on a totally different scale. This doesn't mean that the Syrians did only like uh, activities on in like city centers, like 6th of October city centers on a higher level. They also did a lot on small scale activities on the in these like uh, exclusionary housing projects that they accommodated in. But yet these activities are very different. And the background of the refugee played a very important role in defining these activities, in allowing them to grow and not to grow. And also in exchange, in the exchange experience with the urban poor in Egypt, they have an amazing innovative capacity to actually live in such a city that has a lot of hardships, yet a lot of opportunities. So these exchange experiences that were allowed in spaces like public spaces, the small ones where people could have a coffee shop, which is part of the culture, but also bring secondhand things from downtown like Sudanese and Somalis have proven to be really good at and sell at the same time. So these types of interactions have taken place more and more in the city. And then you can see that like the self-organized structures that the refugees have started in Egypt to form since like, um, since I think their presence in the country, 1950s, 1960s. So these structures have formed a very important um, meeting and congregation points for refugees. And the import, this, this actually also like community schools, like places of for prayers and other places are very important for them also from a community cohesion related background. So like all our integration versus assimilation or uh, exclusion approaches and you know uh, discourses actually need in a way to be uh, to be adjusted to uh, what refugees indeed need uh, refugees need us to step down and go in a way that is in between so that we allow them to nurture their own community and identity uh, forums. But at the same time, we don't have to increase the gap and nurture also exclusion of refugees. But at the same time, we need to allow them to have their own spaces because it's important for them. And so I wanted to put just that actually they are engaged in navigating their own spaces. They have their own choiceful processes and they also create linkages and they create linkages for the city that have never existed. And I would show you just a glimpse on how refugees can bring translocal connections in a city like Cairo, for example, that never had uh, existed before. Like if you look at this map, you can see that some of them move from one place in, to another and in short periods of time because of their need for affordable housing, the depletion of their resources. So they navigate the city spaces in a different way than locals, where you find locals stick to traditional clan affiliations and structures and they move to certain districts where they have safety nets, people from the same area in Upper Egypt, living in the same informal area, and they form their own clan. Refugees actually move and jump from one space to another. And not only that, they actually create linkages between cities and other cities that could be secondary cities that Cairo have never had such relationship, for example, to Gazi Antab in, in Turkey. There used to be direct flights from Gazi Antab to Cairo and like imagining such connections definitely add to the subconscious of the city. A lot of experiences, a lot of perspectives, a lot of stories for sure. And I just wanted to say as a like a conclusion that actually the experiences of refugees of also being host 
differ, hosted differ from one district to another. They are very much related to their background, capacities, numbers also in the city. The host community profile, the socioeconomic and political setup, and also the urban form, like if it's an informal area, new area, existing one, middle class, non middle class, the governance structures, and the socio-spatial and economic situation. And I try to, to a little bit show you that actually an experience of someone would be totally different from another, be, provided their background, their own background, and where they are being hosted and the district form, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a quite very different experience. And this is just my uh, kind of concluding a uh, few remarks that you, you would like, if you would like, I'm sure that Insaf will share the presentation, you can read. I will end up by he here. I think I have consumed my 15 minutes and would like to thank you, wishing you all the best in your studies and in your work with refugees in Indonesia. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you very much, Rasha, for this, you know, um, very deep insight about refugees about especially their dynamics um the urban transformation uh, that happens and that's also i think what is one of the points that are important that it's not something new it's something that is already embedded within you know um let's say uh, our social urban life and uh, you know it's part of our history uh, that we all the time have these movements of population and these people have already their own resilience, their own coping mechanisms, and that there is also, you know, a phases um, in this coexistence process, that there are buffer zones, there are things to consider, there are different criteria to take into account to have a clear reading of these, uh, let's say, very complex uh, transformation uh, processes. Um, and I like also, you know, I will share, of course, the presentation with, the, with the, of those who want us to, to know more. And I'm sure Russia, she's always here as well to, to answer your question. She has a deep, um, you know, understanding and all her findings is actually her field work and her actual work with refugees. And she was behind a lot of, uh, let's say, uh, you know, uh, programs. Uh, whether to support local communities, refugees, etc., and have also her own philosophy towards uh, such, um, you know, uh, subjects. So thank you, Russia, for this. Um, we almost arrived to, we will have the, our Q&A now uh, in a few minutes. Uh, we just have a last presenter uh, who uh, just apologized now. He won't be able to be with us for an emergency. His name is Yunio Mangede Mahaputra. He's a lecturer at the Architecture Department, University of Mar uh, Warmadua, and senior researcher. Um, his presentation or his poster was about urban transformation of a traditional settlement shaped by global tourism and the case of Ubud. Um, after this, uh, I think my, my colleague Teresa will be sharing um, his small video. Uh, it won't be long. And then, uh, of course, I will open the floor for the questions uh, for uh, Russia. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. My name is Nyoman Gede Mahaputra, and I am a researcher from Architecture Department, Universitas Warmadewa. I will be one of the speakers presenting at Post Displacement and Urban Management Conference 2021 within the Space and Place session on 13 Wednesday, September the 8th. I will present about urban transformation of a traditional settlement shaped by global tourism, the case of Google. I will uh, share my screen. Uh, this is my uh, presentation. So we know Ubud is one of uh, many tourist uh, attractions in Bali, and many tourists come to Ubud since uh, uh, the beginning of 20th century. As a result, uh, many investors also come to the area to do investment. Uh, from my analysis, I found that uh, today uh, there are 
contrast plays identity between what is uh, presented on the internet and in reality. In on the internet, we can find that Ubud is shown as a romantic place, while uh, in reality, we see that Ubud is uh, crowded with uh, businesses. Uh, my second result is uh, the people of Ubud negotiated their place identity in order to get economic benefit from tourism. Uh, they try to uh, open the front uh, part of the house uh, as a business place and rented it out to investors while they stay in the backyard of the houses. Uh, research number, number three, most people of Ubud happy with current situation. On the other hand, some of them uh, actually feel insecure due to the lost childhood memories caused by extensive development of the area. And the conclusion, the area of Ubud, which is rooted in uh, layer history, has uh, attracted uh, many visitors. The benefit it brings also invited investors, uh, as well as boost the local to change their buildings, uh, maximize the plot uh, they occupied. Uh, this has resulted in the changing uh, landscape of Ubud. Ubud maintained its uh, attractiveness on the internet. However, in reality, it is not as what has been captured online. In order to maintain the real attractiveness of the area, policy to maintain the place identity of Ubud should be uh, established. Uh, that's my uh, presentation uh, for today. Uh, thank you. Oh. So the same, if you have any questions um, addressed you know, to our speaker, please don't hesitate to um, you know, uh, send uh, the questions. Um, so there is a question for you, Russia. Um, uh, first of all, I love hearing your presentation. Uh, it's from Ridwiani. Does the integration process in the spaces of Cairo happened mostly organic organically by the refugees and local community? I wonder how the local government has played their parts in this process. This is the first question. And um, then the second thing, it's also a comment and a question, I think. It's Cairo and Jakarta are remarkably similar case studies in regards to satellite cities being swallowed by <clears throat> a growing Jakarta and significant distances. My question is whether and how the different nationalities of refugees in Cairo come together as an active actors in navigating the city and negotiating their transition as you very nicely worded it, or whether you find that refugees in Cairo stay very much within their silos of nationalities. Another question, I don't know, Russia, if you want to answer question by question, it's easier maybe for you and then we continue. These are the two first questions and we have another two. So basically, you know, integration happens on different levels. There is first and initial legal integration. If you have the right to stay in the country, have residency, get your children into schools and like work, which is very important. So from that level, the government has limited integration capacity for refugees because refugees can get residencies based on different status, but it's not very sustainable. And it's not sustainable actually. The children can get into schools, but it is based on nationalities and it's based on the government's agreements with certain countries like Sudanese have access to schools, Syrians wouldn't have access, have access, sorry, but some other nationalities do not. So it's not a uniform kind of political setting for all the refugees. It, it differs from one country to another, according to their background. Yet, what happens, of course, is organic. And I wouldn't call it integration uh, specifically because integration is engages also uh, a willingness of the person to integrate and then we cannot impose integration of someone people can actively engage and integrate if they want that right so if we are to talk discuss integration we can discuss the ingredients for integration but then people have the choice or don't have the choice so as for the ingredients in egypt in general there is limited ingredients. It's not enough to make a good integration for people. And 
basically the legal part plays a very important role because in the minds of the policymakers in Egypt, refugees are temporary in the country. And for refugees, some of them, like Syrians, like Egypt, it's very culturally close to Syria. Yeah. And uh, I know cases that left to Europe by sea and came back to Egypt, surprisingly, you might say. And of course, cases that left Egypt and wouldn't come back, but there are cases that actually came back to Egypt, which could say that there is a possibility for people to stay in Egypt and live in Egypt. But yet, it is still hindered by the, the residency regime, by the different aspects and regimes in the country. You know, also the work regime is very important. For um, a bl blue collar or a gray collar worker, it's easier to integrate in the formal sector and integrate, I'm saying, in only in the sector, informal sector in Egypt. But it's not easy for a professional, a liberal professional, like a doctor or an engineer. They cannot work in Egypt. They cannot get permits. So they have to work informally, and this means that they have to co compromise their lifestyle because they would get much less. Mm -hmm. So it's a big story. And uh, maybe you can draw a lot of parallels because I'm sure, I don't know about the, sorry, the legal framework in uh, Indonesia, but I would imagine that usually uh, third world countries tend to politically not allow refugees because it's important for their own citizens to feel they are in the, the government is in favor in favor of them right mm -hmm. and so it's it's a big thing but i can tell you you know the word organically that you used is really quite an important word because organically what's going on on the ground is a lot like people are exchanging experiences adapting integrating in a way like if they want that, getting engaged with Egyptians, actually navigating the power structures of the Egyptians. And in South knows very well, it's, it's a complex power structure. Like you have power, power brokers, uh, it, they call them in Arabic special words, but they have to kind of position themselves within these structures to, to go on and live. And this is by itself a huge thing that refugees could do. And Great. the role of civil society in both sides, the refugee side is quite active and from the Egyptian side. Uh, the Egyptian side has a longest standing experience in development work, especially in informal uh, settlements. So there is a lot to give to refugees for, from an experience based perspective. So yes, this is my answer. I think, I hope I answered like, if you look at city administration, unless they are privatized, like uh, the gated city I was talking about, Rehab, they don't engage, frankly. Like you get them to engage with them because they have a lot of issues that they need to take care of. They are overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the second question was like how similar the two situations are. I think it's the same. Uh, the, the question the second is about how they can engage and come together as active actors. It's also this organically part, but also sustained and support, as you said, by the civil society. They are key people, key actors who are at the same time, you know, open the ways for such organic, you know, organization to strengthen themselves, to structure themselves and, you know, mutate actually to something much bigger than that. And we saw such a phenomenon happening uh, within, within, you know, uh, uh, the, uh, the context of Egypt. That is here, uh, you, you briefly mentioned the Sudanese and Somali refugees in Cairo yeah. develop the local area differently. And they want to know are uh, Sudanese and Somali refugees background different from the background of Syrian refugee in Cairo. How do the urban landscape and economy influenced by Somali and Sudanese refugees differ from those influenced by the Syrian refugees? Yeah, I got the, answer, the question now. I tried to read it different times. Um, you know, basically, of course there are, different refugees in Egypt. Now, how do they interact with each other on the spatial level? It is not very much that you have a lot of refugees living side by side. You know, if you look at one district, 
I give you that example. It's called Arbaunus. It's one of the informal settlements. It's 1 million people. And then it accommodates like 10,000 refugees. So you compare the numbers with the Egyptians, you could be lost in such a district as a refugee. So what plays an important role in the kind of congregation of refugees in refugee meeting points is the refugee background. And that doesn't necessarily follow nationality. It actually follows much more exclusive affiliations. Like you have tribes, you have uh, refugees. If you look at the, for example, uh, sub-Saharan refugees from different smaller groups, like uh, the Sudanese, they, we have the ones that come from Nuba mountains, are very different from the Darfur one, are very different from the Eastern Su Sudan ones. And within those, you have tribes and etc. So like affiliations usually, are important because actually this is what makes people meet together and come together. So even on the level of the Syrians, you have a city affiliation. Like I mentioned the example of people coming from a certain city and then raising the real estate in one district where people from that same city live. So city affiliations are also important. People try to mingle together. Of course, they meet in public spaces that are shared by with Egyptians as well. But it doesn't have that strong influence as much as the influence of their own affiliations that bring them all there together. So if we look at the discourses that usually the international community and regime work on, they like very much to have the refugees integrate together, like bringing the Sudanese and the Syrians and then having a community center for both. I mean, that policy proved to be effective only in a limited term. But you cannot get people to, like in Germany, for example, you have a lot of community work and civil society organizations that are supposedly to work on integration between Germans and migrants, right? But they end up uh, making the Turks like the Syrians and then like the Croatians but the Germans are absent, for example. And we have seen that in some parts of Stuttgart. So, I mean, intra-refugee integration efforts, I believe is, are not very powerful and meaningful for the refugees. Refugees still want their own affiliations to be fostered. Whatever they are, they consider it affiliations, be it national, be it tribal, be it whatsoever. But still, the integration with the hosting structure, whatever these hosting structures are, we call them host community, host community mixed with other refugees, refugees and host community and migrants. But if they are hosted by a structure, it's good to have cooperative efforts with civil society from each and those and actually advance development of all of them. And from that perspective, I see the cooperation and the coming together of different refugees and host communities as a meaningful step, right? But it is not a, an objective by itself to get Sudanese and Somalis together. It's, if they, it is not for their own advancement, if they don't themselves want that, we have no interest in making that happen. Hmm. This is number one. Number two, of course, cityscape and uh, changes that take place uh, is very much different from a refugee group to another. And it is because, I, as I, we mentioned, you know, their background is different. Like when you have an urban experience, you can actually, you can see that you create and you reclaim the urban space very differently from those who don't have an urban experience. So it's very different. And also the nationality in a way or the group you come from, whatsoever that group is, plays a very important role. Because the more, like if you have larger numbers and you are more connected and you have really community structures that are functioning well, operating well, you will see activities and, and adjustments and appropriations and, and, and effects on the community more visibly. And that 
is very important for refugees. So you can see, for example, in Cairo, Sudanese are very much visible and good at organizing themselves politically because they have been in the country since 1950s and they already have active participation politically in their countries. And then when they came to, to Egypt, they actually transferred that. And they can transfer that experience to other refugees and to Egyptians. They are very active. Why you can see the Syrians more active in economic terms, mm -hmm. less than in political terms. Amazing. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Rasha, for, for this and uh, answering uh, all, all this question. Um, I wanted to say that, um, you know, just as a final note, um, there is something I wanted to, you know, to share that um, and to say again that the outlook for the displaced population uh, is still bleak, you know, addressing uh, displacing in the world and Indonesia is essential for both poverty reduction, development and uh, regional stabilization and, and can only be adequately addressed through an integrated development response. This is what we've seen as well through the different, you know, uh, presentation today. Um, there is an urge to formulate a regional policy as well, framework for durable solution uh, to displacement and a rationale for development intervention um, that keep today um, the missing, you know, uh, coining all of that. And the main development challenges for internally or externally displaced people um, in the whole region are the livelihoods, uh, relation with the host communities, cohesion, exhaustion of services, governance, and socio-spatial approach um, it is very essential. Um, the priorities for development responses to the challenge of displacement is to respond to the need of uh, displaced people and person to receiving and returning communities by ensuring political participation and government support at regional and national levels. Um, we need improved monitoring of population movement and knowledge of the needs of displaced person and host and guest communities. And this is, means that also we need to acquire the tools for that. We need to ensure that displaced person and those more generally affected by displacement can benefit from the broader development investments underway in the region and to strengthen government services in affected areas through targeted regional investment programs. We need to create jobs and generate income uh, for them in urban areas, providing resources for them, explore the creative use of new technologies as well, as we've seen with Joe, to extend the benefits of information and development to displaced people who are often mobile and difficult to access and to believe in the capacity and strong inclination of the human for solidarity as well. This means we have to question our tools, methodologies to redefine our roles for more innovative solution. Um, I would like to thank all of the authors, guests, speakers, and all the attendees for their support and insightful inputs. And just a reminder, tomorrow is our last day with two special sessions, Young and Resourceful, and Voices of Refugees with a closing plenary. So see you there and um, have a, a, lovely, a lovely day and evening. <laughs> Bye.